Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Brothers. Brothers. Well, well done on managing to get your lunch and uh, hopefully a wee stretch of the legs as well. I hope the brains are not going to slump in the 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, dip that often happens. If you feel that dip, Mr. Mallison from Strath and Slate has Mars bars and he can, <laughs> he can assist you with your energy levels. I was offered a sample of Lucas Aid um, down in Princess Street the other day and I should really have asked for their whole supply uh, to provide the assembly with a bit of energy for debates. But I think we will have energy in this afternoon's debate on the report of the, the Mission Board. So is the convener with us? He's here. Yes, that's right. Thank you. So we'll begin with uh, 10 of those once again. Is it Lizzie? Yeah. Welcome back. This one? I'll go for this one. Um, moderator, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me again. Uh, and thank you for giving me the extra slot to chat to you guys. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks again for partnering with us. Um, and thank you for the conversations I've been able to have with people. Um, and I hope that I'm able to bring more enthusiasm about more books as I suggest them to you now. Um, but before I do, just a heads up. So I will be closing at 6.30 this evening. So if you've had your eye on a few books, you're not sure whether to get them, get them before 6.30, because afterwards you won't be able to, because I won't be there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so moving on from that, um, I've got three suggestions for you uh, of books. So this first one, so you guys have been looking at mission and revitalization, uh, which is such an encouraging thing. And as Christians, we want to see as many people know uh, uh, and come to love the Lord Jesus. And um, John James's book, Renewal, uh, talks about the connection of church planting with church revitalization, gives some really um, honest and wise words of his own experiences of church revitalization, um, as well as case studies from around the UK. Um, so I would really recommend giving this a read. It's only three pounds in the bookstall um, and maybe even getting it for your ministers, your uh, other elders in the church and discussing um, the ideas of revitalization and how you can do that with uh, uh, a want to reach out to your local community because um, at the moment in the UK as well as around the world there's so many people that still don't know the good news of Jesus. So definitely uh, have a look at this one and we've got plenty to go around. Uh, the second one is uh, a devotional. Uh, so it's J.C. Ryle's daily readings uh, of the four Gospels. Um, so I have this myself, and even though J.C. Ryle wrote so long ago, his words can still bring such beauty and enthusiasm to, um, to the Lord's words, uh, to the words of Jesus. Um, and it has morning and evening devotional readings, so you can use it for a whole year. You can maybe break it down into two years as well. But um, it's normally 29 99 and we're giving it to you for £15. And it looks so beautiful as well. So it's a great addition to your bookshelves. <laughs> so that's the second one. And then finally, um, as I chatted to you guys yesterday about 21 Servants and just hearing of the testimonies of people throughout history, um, that's an encouragement for all ages. And uh, this book by um, Claire Heath-White is a book called Every, Everyone a Child Should Know, which is stories of heroes of faith throughout history, again, from Martin Luther to um, Hudson Taylor. Um, and it's just short expressions of how God has used people throughout history. Um, and as I would say for myself, it's also good to read as an adult, uh, whether you're a child or an adult, this will bring great encouragement to you. And that's only eight pounds. Um, yeah, so they're my recommendations. Uh, as I said before, I'm here till 6.30 tonight. And as well, if you came yesterday morning, I've been able to add more books to the tables. So if you probably haven't seen all of the selection yet, so just come along, uh, feel free to ask me some questions. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lizzie. I'm, I'm sure she's made some more sales this afternoon. So we resume the consideration of the report of the Mission Board, if we're still allowed to call it that, convener. Um, who would like to speak in this debate? That's great. Um, point of order, yes. Yes, Mr. Works. Ask the Assembly's permission to suspend the standing orders so as to bring an amendment to this deliverance. 
I see. Uh, well, it, were, were you not in possession of the information in your amendment before the debate began, Mr. Wilkes? Yes. It's probably better to come and come and speak from from here. So um, I'm going to ask for the advice of the clerks. Uh, do you believe that your amendment will be helpful to the assembly in in coming to a mind on some difficult matter? Uh, I do. Yes. Right. W um, would you like any more information now? Well, or? maybe you could go and discuss the matter with the principal clerk, and he will advise you as to whether he thinks it's something the assembly should hear more about. Well, I you do. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> yes. I see. Right. The general assembly does have the power to suspend. Okay. And in the light of the feeling through the Assembly at an earlier discussion, I think the amendment might be right. helpful. Right. And, uh, okay. Um, or we can just make a decision on whether we want to suspend the standing orders or not at this stage. Um, normally, I'm not keen that we should do that, but... Um, if, if it is going to be helpful to, to prevent uh, some important matter from being discussed. I trust the processes of the church and I trust the wisdom of the General Assembly to hear people and to come to wise decisions. And so if someone has missed the bus because they didn't get an amendment in, in good time, my inclination would be, I think, to overlook our man-made ordinance and to allow the assembly to come to a wise decision and hear different points of view. Is that agreeable to the House? doesn't mean that I'm going to like anything that I hear from these two gentlemen, but um, I think the last thing I want is people to go home on Thursday and think, I didn't get a chance to say what I wanted to say or to put my arguments. So we want to have open debate. We will sometimes disagree. We shouldn't be afraid of that, okay? Because it's the gospel the free church exists for. And I don't mind passion, but we, we come back to the word of God and we look to the head of the church for our decisions. So well, Mr. Wilkes, uh, do you wish to move your, your, is it an amendment or an addendum that you have? It is a, an amendment. It's an amendment. Okay. Can it be distributed or? Uh, it, it is extremely straightforward. Okay. All right. Well, speak to the matter then and um, let us know what's on your mind. Maybe read it twice. Uh, the proposal itself is straightforward. I propose that we strike deliverance item C10 from the report, which is on page 60. Um, page 60, item C10, if I've written that down correctly, that is the directive to appoint a church planting director, officer. I move this with great trepidation in that the last thing I wish to do is fuel any dichotomy between planting and revitalization and rural ministry and urban ministry. I wish to be clear that I am enthusiastic about the planting of new churches and I hope that that will continue. Well, let's hear one point of order at a time. So let's, let's allow Mr. Wilkes to read what he has before we... Um, I, I think I may well have sympathy with what you're about to say. Um, but let's hear Mr. Wilkes. So do you want to start at the top and read, read your, your suggesting that point 10 be deleted and the rest be renumbered? Yes. Okay. Um, 
the logic being uh, that I feel we should actively determine whether we believe this is the best usage of the church's funds at this present time. Noting uh, Mr. Kane's point earlier uh, about uh, the appointment of a revitalization officer, uh, and whilst I take uh, Reverend Meredith's point that he is enthusiastic about revitalization, I fear that the appointment of a second person working full-time on planting may in fact further the feeling in the church that these two are in tension with one another and that one is being favored above the other. Furthermore, uh, the Board of Trustees have made it clear that the proper processes have not been followed in the creation of this new post. So I would rather it returned next year okay. for proper consideration. Well, we, we have heard you. Um, I don't know if you have a seconder. Yeah. Thank you. Can we speak through a microphone, please, Mr. Fraser? Moderator, surely we have to suspend standing orders before we hear an argument for an amendment. Mm -hmm. I have an open mind as to whether we should uh, suspend mm -hmm. standing orders, but mm -hmm. I understood that if we are not following standing orders, which we're not now, we, the House should be asked to suspend them mm -hmm. in order to allow Mr. Wilkes, if the House so desires, mm -hmm. um, to put forward his amendment. Now, I can understand that listening to what the actual amendment is might help the House to yes. know if it should, but we shouldn't be hearing an argument for the amendment, no. either for or against. And I, I worry that statements have been made about the Board of Trustees, which the Board of Trustees would probably not uh, think That's factual. Okay. Well, Moderate, well, I, I, Moderate, sorry, I understood from the way that you addressed the Assembly that the Assembly agreed that we had I suspended think, standing orders. Well, that, that, was, was, that was my impression. That was my impression too. So. We have to use microphones, Mr. Fraser. I didn't think the House understood that standing orders had been suspended, and I didn't see a show of hands for suspending standing orders. Mr. Meredith, come and speak to us. I do have to say that something that is bold and in the print um, and quite clear in the print, the, the opportunity to amend this was given yesterday. Um, and so I'm not entirely comfortable with the process that is uh, being proposed at the moment by Mr. Wilkes. Mr. Um, Meredith. Moderator, first of all, please don't think that a point of order is an antagonistic move. It, it's not at all. Uh, it's simply that I think the mission board and actually the trustees are not against one another. And I think this requires an in -depth, more in-depth discussion. And there are already processes in place that the trustees will not accept a major spending decision without it going to them. So mm -hmm. there are checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So that my point of order, moderator, is I'm, I'm reluctant to, uh, for standing orders to be suspended in this matter, which is somewhat complex mm -hmm. and, you know, with, with, with due respect requires a calmer context in which to discuss it. And I think if you trust the mission board and the trustees, uh, I think that you will get a good outcome on this. So I don't see the, it's not going to debate yet about suspending standing orders, but it's your call moderator, but uh, I would be happier if the due process remained because it's there for a purpose. The checks and balances are good. Thank you. Mr. McLeod Dumblain, was your. Uh, you can't speak from a sedentary position without a microphone. We Just have do. microphones down here, or. I can maybe speak from you. Uh, my amendment is on the same topic, but rather different. It's a compromise amendment. Well, okay. So which we... I think uh, maybe David uh, and uh, Trevor might or might not agree with. Uh, I don't know. I know what I want to say, I don't know when to say it, or uh, at what point the proceedings I may be allowed to say it. 
Well, I think we do have to sort out whether, <laughs> whether we are applying the usual standing orders or not. So uh, well, that is down to... Yes, I think more of the, the, a request has been made for that, so before we discuss anything else, we should yes. make a decision on that. Okay. So we're asking the Assembly whether they wish to suspend standing orders or not. And having heard the nature of the matter, I would not be inclined to think that it was appropriate to do so because the, the opportunity to disagree with a proposal from a board. These papers were issued at the beginning of May. They've been online for three weeks or something like that. Um, and it really is incumbent upon members of the Assembly to read their papers and think about them before they come. I understand if it's your first General Assembly that people can be tripped up, but uh, it's, um, it's quite a major thing to, uh, to miss reading the standing orders and the implications of it. So I would be inclined not to go down the route of receiving uh, out of time amendments to this matter. Do I have the agreement of the House that we do not suspend standing orders. You can overrule the moderator on this if you wish, but do I have your, do I have your consent? Well, moderator, I'm not sure that it's company to do that. I, th I think the Assembly has the right to decide itself and yes. the request has been made and I'm not sure that the moderator should rule on that without asking the Assembly to vote on the matter. Very good. Uh, well, I don't mind the Assembly voting on the matter. I've told you that I think what I think about it and I don't need to repeat myself. In that case, can we have a simple show of hands? Could I ask that those would show who are in favour of applying the normal standing orders of the General Assembly in this debate? That means that there will be no fresh amendments. Who wishes to apply the normal standing orders of the General Assembly to this debate? Okay, I'll let the clerk have a wee count. If you can vote clearly, please. This looks like it might take a careful count. It's been a long time since the moderator had to use a casting vote. You got a count? And those who would wish to um, suspend the normal standing orders to allow amendments to this report, please clearly vote now. I think the standing orders carry. Orders carry. And so that does mean that for those who wish to make an amendment, you can still speak, you can still make your point, and your point will be heard. And it is entirely possible that you will persuade people by what you have to say, but uh, the rules are the rules and the rules we will apply today. So I apologise, Mr Wilkes, if you uh, feel stymied by being at your first General Assembly and being tripped up by rules, but them's the rules for us all, unfortunately. Thank you, moderator. Um, yeah. I apologise for taking up your time. No, no, Thank not you. at all. And uh, do speak in the debate and uh, you can explain your thinking then. So I call for any speakers to this debate. Mr. McLeod and Blaine, would you like to speak? Ms. Moderator, Innes McLeod and Blaine is my name. Fathers and brethren, Shalom to the moderator. We always need shalom. I think this is a good moment to remember shalom. Shalom to Professor Ackroyd. Shalom to David Meredith. Shalom to Ian McCaskill. I think we'll take the role as red. <laughs> <laughs> and my apologies. I haven't got the excuse of this being my first assembly to create that chaos, but there you go. <laughs> I'd like to share a few thoughts with you about the Mission Board report. I come as a peacemaker, and you'll see why I say that shortly. <clears throat> 
Firstly, thanks to Bob and David and Ian for the report and their comments and um, on, on parts of it. The whole denomination is greatly indebted to the new way of doing things, I think. The mission board, the mission director, and all the simplified structures we now have in place are greatly beneficial to meeting the business of our church and bringing it forward in a more focused, more purposeful manner than previously. My first point. So thanks to these gentlemen and all the others concerned uh, in the mission board and uh, in the other principal committees of our church and boards. Incidentally, I, I was surprised to see in today's program <coughs> Momentum Generation brand. Momentum, said I to myself, as one of the items on today's program. I thought, as you know, Momentum is a very active left-wing organization. And I thought, has James Fraser burnt all the blue books already? <laughs> Have the left-wingers taken over the free church? Are we all going to receive the little red book? And sure enough, we did receive a little red book shortly after that. So no wonder an old boy like myself got somewhat confused. But all is well. We will not be given out a red book entitled The Thoughts of Chairman James and David. <laughs> That's a vicious rumour, a monumental blunder, a monumental rumour going on. We are greatly indebted to both these gentlemen for their sterling work as leaders in our denomination. To be serious. And I'll watch how I phrase my words. I'm not unduly known for doing so, so I shall try not to put my foot in it. I think there is some confusion in the assembly around the church planting initiatives, and they are excellent and hugely encouraging initiatives. We are pleased about Nathan Olson's work as a facilitator for church planting. Now, it's my fault, probably I didn't know much about this gentleman or his work, and I wonder how many commissioners indeed are aware of the work that he's doing. If we are to agree, and maybe that's me, it's my age perhaps, not picking things up too well, or maybe we do need to look at communications, uh, maybe that's an example, I don't know. If we are to agree to the appointment of a new facilitator for church planting, uh, as Colin McLeod said earlier, in addition to the person already in post, given there seem to be some, and I'm picking my words, there seem to be some tensions in the denomination or perceived tensions, David, perceived tensions between church planting and church revitalization and how they work together. Could I be a peacemaker, a bringer of shalom, and suggest given this second appointment, if it happens, in the area of church planting, that we tweak the title. So my, 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 suggestment is, my suggestion isn't so much an amendment as a tweak. So we'll tweak it a wee bit. And uh, page 60 of the deliverance, if you could turn to page 60, gentlemen, uh, the deliverance uh, point 10, which is the hub of the argument that we are discussing right now. Uh, which Trevor was concerned about and which other have concerns about. And what if we simply said, and I'm giving this suggestion to David as a possibility and to Bob, uh, support the, the work of church planting and church revitalization. And later on, uh, in the same paragraph, approve the creation of the post of church planting and revitalization director. It's a tweak. Why this is important? Yeah. It's like the momentum thing. It's only a couple of letters. And this is only a couple of words. But there are um, concerns about the balance. And this is in conversation with one or two people. Uh, in my perception, there is a certain tension between the pace of advance of church planting, which are great. We're all agreed with that. We're here to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it, it's great that we are getting so much involved in church planting. Uh, on the, at the same time, uh, we have to get the balance right. There are many churches needing help to revitalize, to reach out to their communities, whether they are rural, town, country, city. And that's what as an assembly, as a denomination, that's what we're talking about, right? That's what this debate is about. It's about how and to what extent we proceed with the church revitalization uh, and church planting 
and how they go forward together in a way that is acceptable to everybody in the denomination. Now, it would address the concerns of many commissioners, as I say, that revitalization is of equal importance to the mission board, as David has said. He's equally, he's, he's equally committed to, which he is, because I, I've heard him speak in a presbytery, and I know he's very committed to revitalization also. I'm almost there, moderator. Uh, first of all, it would help, I think, as, as presbyteries, as a denomination, uh, to advance the arguments, uh, not so much for and against, as in a united way, in a peaceful way, in a pleasant way, working together to move forward both areas of expansion of our church, uh, God willing. And secondly, I think this might help the trustees and the Board of Mission working together if, if there were to be funding that this person, who is a second appointment in terms of the planting, uh, to be also a uh, planting and church revitalization officer or director. End of story. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. McLeod. I'll leave that with you. Thank you. I think earlier in our deliberations it was suggested that already a great deal of the work of the Mission Board is to do with revitalization. And by, by far the lion's share of the expenditure of the church is on existing congregations. And of course we all want existing congregations to thrive. Um, we actually spend very little on church planting. So I hope we're not going to spend the whole afternoon chasing our tails about problems that don't really exist. I say I do, it's not the job of the moderator to give you lectures, but let's conserve our energy for things that are going to change uh, Scotland rather than to, you know, tilt at windmills. Um, I don't think there's disagreement in this house. So be careful that we don't manufacture disagreement that doesn't exist. I think there's great agreement in this house about these matters. But I would love to hear some speakers, and Mr. McLeod Dornoch got his hand up first. Moderator, you've come a long way since. I first came across you as a boy. You were called prof then. Now you're called moderator. Uh, congratulations on your um, appointment and uh, your address uh, yesterday. Uh, I found very uh, encouraging and stimulating. I've been asked by uh, Chairman Bob uh, to say a few words about the work in Dornoch. Before I do that, if I just make a comment uh, about what we've been hearing, discussed about church planting and uh, revitalization uh, and rural ministry. Uh, Bob began his address today uh, by referring to the late Kenny MacDonald and uh, Kenny was a long-standing friend of, of many of us and he had a passion uh, for the work of rural evangelism. He really did. But he didn't have that passion at the expense of urban evangelism or the church planting uh, that's going on in different parts of the church. Uh, Kenny was aware that both uh, types of ministry were equally important. And I think that we need to take on board the fact that we're not talking about one thing against the other. They're both vital uh, to what we're about. I want also to pay tribute at this point to uh, David Meredith, the mission director. Uh, David has been extremely helpful to us uh, in Dornoch regarding the whole process of what's involved in revitalization. He's already met with us twice, and we look forward to him coming again next month and sharing how everybody in the congregation has a role to play in this vital work. I want to just say a few things about our situation, not in order to boast, because we've nothing to boast about other than in what the Lord is doing. But a number of years ago, Donna was in every way a marginal congregation. But over the years since then, uh, thanks to seeking to encourage and equip uh, all who profess faith uh, in the congregation to be involved uh, using their gifts. Uh, we've seen uh, remarkable encouragements. Uh, we're seeing more people now attending Sunday services, one of the main reasons being that they are being invited uh, along by committed Christians 
uh, and these Christians are often able to share the faith uh, with the folks they're invited before they come even uh, along to our service at all. And we've seen uh, that happening right across the age group. Uh, we're on our little lambs uh, group on a Friday morning, and very often I know that uh, the complaint is heard that we don't see much fruit from it. But we need to be patient, and we've sought to be patient, and now we're beginning to see fruit. Now we're beginning to see one, possibly more, of those who have been contacted there as a result of one of the leaders sharing the gospel uh, beginning to come along, and I believe in one case, uh, at least, may already have become uh, a Christian. Uh, we've been seeing uh, a lot of work done among our young uh, folk. We have a number of committed young folk, and uh, they have now been encouraged to use their various gifts uh, in different ways, and we're grateful uh, to God for the ways in which he has gifted them and for the way in which they're now beginning to feel that they can uh, use these gifts. Uh, last year, we drew up a five-year uh, strategic plan for the congregation, and uh, it's all very easy to draw up such a plan and then put it uh, down and forget about it. But we are seeking to implement uh, and to improve uh, the plan as time goes on, and we're very encouraged uh, by seeing, as I've said, more of our folks now being involved in active ministry within the congregation. I would say that, that the key uh, to revitalization has been the personal engagement of folks in the congregation with friends and neighbours and acquaintances, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, we also seek to have a kingdom mindset. It's also very easy to become denominational in your thinking, but those of you who know the history will know that a long time ago, the Dawn of Christian Fellowship uh, formed largely as a group who left the Free Church at that time. And obviously in a rural community that causes uh, a lot of difficulty. But in recent times we've uh, now had various joint meetings and both ourselves as leaders uh, in the Free Church and in the Fellowship are meeting regularly uh, for prayer. And we're very uh, pleased about that because we believe that if we pray together then the Lord can only bless that and we trust that it's honouring to him. There are a number of activities that we're engaged in uh, as a congregation that I know many of your congregations are engaged in, but if you just uh, seek to encourage uh, all your members to use their gifts and equip them uh, for that, then you'll be amazed at what the Lord can do. Uh, before I sit down, can I just say that um, <laughs> the Lord goes ahead of us, and I'm not the most gifted person on earth in virtually every area of life. I'm very, very few gifts. But uh, as far as practical things are concerned, I'm absolutely useless. But in the congregations I've been in, the Lord has graciously provided men uh, and women with these practical gifts. I'm a useless administrator. <laughs> but in our congregation in Dornach just now, we have one of the best administrators I've ever come across in my life. And our task, and I see my task in the time that I've got left, <laughs> is to, to seek to encourage uh, these men and women and everyone else in the congregation to use their gifts together for God's glory. I could say a lot more, but there have been many things to encourage us, and let's not see a dichotomy between a church planting in urban communities and revitalization of congregations across the country. I don't know if Dorna is urban or rural, it's a royal borough, and they're proud of it. <laughs> uh, but God is working right across the land and let's encourage each other. Let's encourage David, let's encourage Bob, let's even encourage McCaskill <laughs> and everyone else who's involved in the work of seeking to win this needy nation for Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Neil Lachlan MacDonald. Uh, can I just see the other hands just now? Those who keep listening. Oh, that's great. That's really good. We'll take Jim Patterson after Neil MacDonald. Moderator, fathers and brethren, moderator, congratulations on your election to office. We will be remembering you throughout the year in prayer, both you, your wife and your family. Thanks to Bob and to the members of the Mission Board for the report, which was extensive. I want to start off by uh, just putting a wee scenario before you. Where else in the world would you find a Free Church of Scotland minister, a Free Church member, uh, a Free Presbyterian and a Church of Scotland adherent 
working in peace, harmony, and joy together? Well, of course, it's around the bonnet of a Massey Ferguson 35. <laughs> now, you see, I probably couldn't do that, engage in these ecumenical relations if I was in city or urban ministry. But because I'm in rural ministry, I have that opportunity. Last year, I was a commissioner here at the assembly, and uh, a Spanish-looking fellow came over to me, never having met him before. It turns out he wasn't Spanish, but he was from Scalpi, <laughs> and uh, introduced himself as Martin Cunningham and said, oh, you're coming to our communion in a couple of weeks. I said, oh, yes, I am coming. And now I stand here as uh, the minister of that congregation uh, just one year later. It's amazing uh, how the Lord works. But the board, uh, how, mission board, have been gracious uh, in releasing me, you could say, from the ministry in South Uist and Bimbecula, which I would uh, commend to you. I would commend the congregation there to your prayers uh, as they seek uh, the way forward. But the Lord made it very clear that we would go uh, and uh, minister in Loch Broom and Coigach, um, for which we are thankful. It would seem that I am, I don't know if the word is condemned, but set to a life of having churches 25 miles apart. So when in South Uist I would travel 20, 23 miles down to Loch Boisdale, I now have a congregation in Atleti which is 25 miles from Alapool. So you guys that wander down to your church for the morning service and then mosey home and have a nice leisurely afternoon and then mosey back in the evening. Remember those of us who have a 50 mile round trip, may it be said through some of the most stunningly beautiful uh, landscape that we have. But we cover a, a massive geographical area uh, from Dundonnell in uh, the south right up to, I suppose, Loch Inver in the north. It's a, um, that's a massive area. Uh, it is a lively and vibrant congregation. Uh, we are very thankful for diligent, uh, willing and wise elders, Martin, <laughs> Uh, David Rennick and Dunkey McKenzie. Um, I guess you could say we're seeking to follow the model of the New Testament church. We are uh, putting a, a focus on prayer. We have Alapool Uplifted on a Tuesday morning. We have the prayer meeting on Wednesday evening and another Bible study prayer meeting in Nathalie on a Thursday. Um, we are pursuing excellence in praise and having a, a harmony group that meets once a fortnight in the manse. Great singers and amazing to hear the parts sung. So I would just echo what was said last night, that uh, invest in your praise, because it is an integral and important part of our worship. Uh, there are various ways in which we engage with the community around about us, toddlers, um, the Sailor Society, where the church is open to uh, crew and um, people off the cruise ships that are coming in. I think 25 cruise ships coming in this, this season, which is the most Alapool has ever seen. We enjoy good fellowship at both ends of the congregation. You could say we enjoy uh, joint services down in, in Achilte Bui uh, that people come along. Um, so there is a lot happening. There is much to do. How do we reach more people? How do we break down the stereotypes uh, that hold people back from coming through the doors of our churches? You know, some of the greatest evangelical opportunities that we have are funerals because that is the only time when the communities around about us will actually step over the threshold of our churches. Um, so we really have to disciple our, our people, inspire our people uh, into service. Um, and that comes through the word preached and the word lived out and demonstrated by the leadership uh, of the church. Because we have to change perceptions and we have to get people to hear the word of God David was talking about changing perceptions regarding um, church planting, you know, from the wider church. I think there is a, an excitement about church planting. I think it's commendable, and I think we should do more. Um, but there's also perhaps the perception on the other side of things that, that people do feel that they're forgotten a wee bit, and the church is merely focused on uh, church planting. We know that that's not the case but again, it comes back to communication. So hopefully now with generation and with new ways of communication, we can uh, inspire uh, our people. So I would commend uh, South US to your prayers. I would commend uh, Loch Broom and Koiga to your prayers for wisdom as to how to know to reach people over such a wide area. I would also uh, commend to your prayers our friend and our colleague, Dan Patterson, in Pulyunalt Bay. Uh, it is raised in 
the youth section on page 61 there, point E5. Just to remember Dan and Penny and the boys in your prayers, and we hope that Dan will be back uh, with us very soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. So Mr. Patterson, and followed then by Mr. Macaulay, and who else wants to speak? So we'll maybe take you then, Hamish Sneddon, after Mr. Macaulay. Moderator, fathers and brethren, um, as my first time at this assembly and first time to speak at it, uh, I must get somebody to explain to me when a brother becomes a father in this august assembly. Uh, would those who are fathers maybe like to admit it? <laughs> um, among the encouraging and interesting things in the, the mission report, uh, I was very pleased to see paragraph 5 on page 47, which talks about Christian education and the, the efforts of a team up in Inverness to, to look at how we give a Christian worldview to our children. And I want today to uh, introduce you, if you have never heard of it, to a little organisation called Christian Values in Education Scotland, which uh, has only been going out a few years. And I want to encourage you to pray for and to encourage our day school teachers. Nearly all of us, I imagine, have day school teachers in our congregations. Uh, our Sunday school teachers, they do a wonderful job and we remember them often. They have an hour a week, perhaps, with children. Our day school teachers have about 25 hours a week with their classes. 25 hours when they can be salt and light and bring the fragrance of Christ into their classrooms. Schools are being flooded with non-Christian and indeed anti-Christian uh, materials. And teachers are expected to use these materials. Secularists and the whole LGBT lobby uh, produce materials, present their beliefs boldly, seeking the hearts and minds of our children. Now, Christian teachers can be more timid often because they're not quite sure what they can say without being politically incorrect, uh, and or how to present an alternative Christian worldview. Now, CVE, Christian Values in Education Scotland, exists to provide information for our teachers on the legal framework in which they operate, to provide resources and encouragement uh, to Christian teachers. And I would want to encourage you all, of you, all of us who are ministers, all of you who are ministers, to encourage your teachers. Uh, um, with, if the moderator agrees, we're going to give out one of these little cards to everyone afterwards. Get your teachers to go online, go online yourselves, and see what CVE uh, is, is doing and how it can benefit your teachers. CVE also encourages parents and grandparents to get involved in school boards and to, to be in there because our, our schools are short of money and they're very often very glad to get any help they can get. In addition, CVE are organising training days for school chaplains and producing materials for use by these chaplains. There's a couple of training days coming up very soon. The, the, these, this book here, 24 Time for Reflection talks, ties in with the Curriculum for Excellence, uh, great for use uh, in your, when you get a chance to go into school. And um, again, training days, a couple of training days coming up, I believe, in the next month. So please look up the website, see what CVE is doing. Please let your congregations and your teachers know about CVE. Uh, and there is an exceptional opportunity to learn a wee bit more about CVE this Saturday, just in three days' time, when CVE are organising a, a dinner in a hotel in Livingston. And there's still some places if you'd like to come and learn about CVE. I believe there's seven places still 
available in that dinner. So you need to get on the website pretty quick and um, uh, book your place if you'd like to come. So thank you very much, moderator. Thank you. Can we absolutely, if, uh, Mr. Patterson, if you'd like to place them maybe on some of these tables at the front and at the back, and right. people, Christian values in education. Thank you very much for that. I'm not sure if you're a father or a brother, but that was a maiden speech. <laughs> and it was a very good one. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Macaulay, and then I think we said we'd have Mr. Snedden. Who else wants to speak? So, Mr. Lamont, and then Angus. It's Angus, isn't it? Yeah. Moderator, fathers, brethren, chairman, mission director, thank you for your report. Very comprehensive, very informative. And uh, it is very exciting to hear of what is happening at church plants and to hear the news from Stirling, uh, to hear about Cornerstone and all these places where things are uh, going well. Uh, I will, however, be supporting a Roddy Rankin's addendum, um, not because I'm against church planting in any way whatsoever or against work in the central belt, but I am aware, being a Northern Presbytery, that it is a struggle uh, to attract men. We have charges there that have been looking for people for for a long uh, time. So I support Roddy's addendum. I like Innes's tweak, although I know we're not voting on that one. I'm also in favour of Massey Ferguson's, and I think as an ecumenical tool that maybe the trustees could look at funding them for those in rural ministry, that would be a good start. But anyway, I've been asked to share a little bit about what's been happening in a Tain and Fern. Uh, for those of you who don't know, these were two congregations that were united in 2010 due to one of them not being viable, the fern end. And really the revitalization uh, began during the vacancy, began long before I went there, with just people inviting people uh, to church. And we're thankful to the Lord that we've seen attendances increase steadily over past years, a joint morning attendance. So they very much operate as two congregations. Uh, the joint morning attendance is currently about 190 people. So attendance, is, that's great, but what we prayed for and what we longed for was to see people being saved, and God did that uh, quite miraculously. In 2016, we had 28 additions to our communicant role, 18 of these by profession of faith. It really was a wonderful work of God. One weekend, we had three people got saved, Friday, Sunday, Monday and somebody the following week. We praise God for his work, wherever it's taking place, whether it's in central Scotland or in rural highlands. Our youngest convert was 11, the oldest was 90. I wanna just tell you what the 90 year old, he said to me, he had thought about professing his faith for a long time. I said, what kept you? He gave the usual answer, I wasn't good enough. I said, what's changed? He says, I think I'm getting worse. But wasn't that a great token of eyes being opened, of God working in someone's life? We're blessed to be reaping where others have sown. And it's been a real privilege, you might not think, to have three former ministers of your congregation still resident in the congregation would be a blessing. But it has been to us. And it's been a blessing to them because they have sowed for many long years. And they were there to see these people uh, being saved. It wasn't all great. The increase in people meant an increase in burden, a great need for discipling. And to be honest, I barely made it through 2016. It was a real struggle. Uh, so we're delighted when last year this time the assembly gave us permission for an assistant. And even more delighted when Reverend Andrew McLeod joined us in November last year. That has transformed ministry for me, just to have someone to share with, to work alongside, to share the burdens and to share the privilege of ministry as well. We've had one further encouragement of late, and that is with the APC uh, coming to worship with us all the time. We have held joint meetings with them every second Sunday evening for the last two years. But they've just agreed to worship with us at all services with the stated intention that at the end of this year, the two congregations will become one. That has been a great blessing to us. I hope it's been a blessing to them as well. There are challenges, however. We need committed men. We have huge numbers of women in membership whose husbands do not come at all. That is a major challenge. And we have a headache. We need a new building in Tain, but we're also 
beginning to see the need for a new building in Fern as well. Tain is, we've got the site, we've got the plans, we've got the permission. We just need the cash. Hopefully a big loan for the trustees. They're great guys. And I was going to take the, the chair and vice chair out for dinner tonight, but I've got to go to this launch of this Gallic Bible thing. So, But anyway, they're good guys. And we, we just got to pray that the Lord will provide for us there because we have begun talking about the need for a new building in Fern now as well. And that is a headache. Here's where you can help us. We need more Bibles. NIVs, 1984. If you've got any you're getting rid of, please let us know. We've sourced 50 plus over the last couple of years and we still don't have enough. So if you've got Bibles, and pray, pray for the work in the north. We've been blessed in Tain and Fern, but there is huge need across the north. So please remember a, a presbytery uh, in your prayers. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Derek and Angus McKellar. You after Derek. Thank you. Fathers and uh, brothers, uh, I'd like to commend the work of the board. Uh, it's astonishing how much work they manage to do. And uh, having been chairman of the board, I know uh, how much work is involved. Uh, so I really am amazed at the length of this report and the amount of work that they've been doing. And uh, I'm very grateful to them for that work. I'd just like to speak for a moment to Roddy Rankin, or to Roddy Rankin's uh, addendum. A um, couple of things. I don't recognise uh, what Roddy says about urban ministers being cool and sophisticated, um, apart from in my case, obviously. Um, nor do I recognise any sense of condescension among those who work in the cities uh, towards uh, those who don't. Um, Roddy is a fantastic example of a rural minister. Um, and an effective rural minister doing an effective work over many long years. And Glenelg obviously has a very special place in my heart. Uh, so um, I think Roddy is doing a great job. I recognise he's stretched in lots of different ways, but he's being inventive and he has workers with him and uh, he needs support uh, in enabling workers to effectively be able to minister there. I think uh, the answers to this issue are not simple, and they're certainly not simplistic. And sometimes I think we come up with sound bites at the assembly with simplistic answers, which are not really helpful and uh, which are not thought through and uh, are not really uh, wise. Uh, the reality for me, I think, is that our previous model, which I think was rose-colored spectacles we sometimes look back at was financially unsustainable. Uh, the church was almost bankrupted. We know that. That's factual. Um, and it was unrealistic in that a few financially stronger churches uh, were being drained uh, massively to support uh, many other churches. It was centralist. Uh, it was uh, endangering or the danger was it was bringing in a culture of dependency or entitlement. And it was a failed uh, system. Now, I'm not sure how that system can ever be replaced, or I, I, I do believe it can be bettered. But my suggestion for the board uh, is that the board should consider setting up a forum uh, to look into the challenges of the provision of ministry in rural Scotland. I actually don't think Roddy has been speaking a lot about revitalization, although the two are not uh, delinked. Uh, he's been speaking about ministry provision, which is a slightly different issue, I think, if I'm right in saying that. Um, but I would, I would encourage the board to consider a forum to look into the challenges of the provision of ministry. Uh, I think it should be made up of Roddy. Uh, he should be on it. See, it's bad when you say something uh, that needs to be changed unless, you, um, unless you're willing to be part of that change. Uh, so he should be on it with one or two others who have long and uh, noble experience uh, in uh, rural ministry. 
And I think they should be tasked with coming up with solutions. We're all good at um, exposing the problems, uh, as Mission Board Chairman, and I know all about that. Uh, people were very quick to expose the problems that there was, not so quick to provide the answers. Um, and provide solutions that are financially sustainable in the long term, um, that are realistic. Uh, I find it interesting that church planting is sometimes seen as glamorous or an easy option. Uh, I would like to dispel that, that raising 95% of your own funding, not having a house uh, or buildings uh, and uh, no fixed congregation is very tough, as is rural ministry. It's just a different toughness. And I absolutely go with all the uh, comments that have been made about working through this together. So it does need to be realistic. Um, uh, and I also think it needs to be visionary. I think we need to be thinking of new models. I think some examples have already been given to us and we can learn from uh, uh, many rural situations that are good, but I do think we need to consider different models of ministry and different ways of providing ministry. And I think sometimes our congregations in rural areas need to be willing to change and not expect everything just to remain the same as they always have been. Thank you. Thank you Dr. McKellar, and can I see some hands? So if I can have James Fraser, and then if I can have Mr. Wilkes, uh, and then I'll, I'll name one or two more. We're gonna to have to wrap this up about half past three, because there is another report, and then there's an order of the day. But I, I really don't want to uh, stop people being heard and there are at least eight or nine hands so if we could you know keep it to three four minutes that would be helpful dr mckellar uh, moderator uh, brethren uh, can i say again how encouraging it is uh, to be here uh, as i look round about me and as i meet with people i can only see resource a potential men of god um, it, it's it's incredibly encouraging to be here uh, and I guess those of you who've been taking part for many years uh, don't, don't lose sight of the tremendous resource that God has put uh, together in this room for his glory. Uh, I was struck by the phrase in the Board of Trustee Report 7.2.3, special evangelistic effort. And I've been ruminating about this and thinking about it and, and trying to understand it because the paragraph that says in, in that report, um, there's if there's potential for growth in a congregation and if there's reason to believe that special evangelistic effort on the part of the denomination could lead to realizing this potential, then... And I'm thinking, if there is potential for growth, so, so what does special evangelistic effort actually mean? I've been incredibly influenced by reading the book uh, The Insanity of God by Nick Ripkin. It's an amazing book, and it describes the persecuted church. And it asks the question, does everyone who's a Christian in the world have freedom to proclaim Christ? And it gets me thinking that we're not actually in the real world here. We're in a very small part of the world, and it's not, it's not the normal Christian world because we're not persecuted. Apparently, people say up to 80% of believers are living in environments where they are being persecuted, 80%. So we are the abnormal. Some persecuted believers say that they view their persecution and their time in jail as giving somehow the non-persecuted part of the body more opportunity. That gives a very special responsibility to the likes of us. He describes the church in China. When they get to 30 believers in a fellowship, they have to replicate because if they're over 30, they're at such risk of persecution that they have to go and plant another church. It leads me to ask the question, what's the ideal size of a church? Buildings. The Chinese government 15 years ago decided the best way to control growth in the Christian church was to give some of them buildings and to pay some of the ministers and then to exercise control and make them dependent upon their buildings and upon their finances. 
We've talked about revitalization. The remote and rural culture is changing. We're seeing it changing. We know that we cannot continue to run services, um, you know, basic uh, council and health services in the north unless we have new jobs. We can't have new jobs without new people. We're seeing in our parishes, maybe in some places, up to 50% are not indigenous people. But what are we doing to reach out to these people? What special evangelistic effort are we all taking part in in order to reach everyone with the gospel? How can we be a bridge between church and community? How can we be a bridge to Christ? Because most normal non-Christian people wouldn't see any reason to walk into a building where strange things happen from their point of view. Even congregational singing, many people would regard as being slightly weird from a non-Christian perspective because it's not their culture. So we have, to, we have to portray Christ in order for people to be attracted towards Christ. And that no assumption that anyone's going to walk through a door of a church building to encounter Christ. We need to be connected with global mission. We've seen ourselves that when we take people from this context into another context, in our example into Nepal, taking youth groups there, uh, and we expose them to a thriving church that has known persecution in the past, it's currently not really being persecuted, it is a little bit, uh, meeting people whose parents may have been persecuted, meeting new believers who they themselves were persecuted, seeing God at work in new ways, we find transformation in our own youth and adults. We have seen people come to Christ through that experience. We have seen members of our own church go back into um, lifelong involvement in uh, global mission. There's something really important within the body of Christ about connecting our people here in the privileged 20%, over-dependent on buildings, over-dependent on finance, with vibrant churches who have very little resource. We need to increase the connection. We need to expose one another to this wonderful uh, world. And the challenge, um, how can we take risk how can we take risk for, for God? How can we be outside our comfort zone? How can we risk re reputation? And how can we address the challenge of the number of churches in our denomination that are financially secure? Because when does a church start replicating? So if God has so deemed that a church has 300 members uh, and two or 300,000 pounds a year income, then that's a tremendous responsibility within the body of Christ for us to use that resource to God's glory, thinking of the Chinese churches who replicate once they reach 29 or more. Mr. Fraser, followed by Mr. Wilkes, and then I think Malcolm Campbell from Garibus caught my eye. Uh, oh, no, did I? I said your name, Hamish. You're next, actually, aren't you? You're next, and then Mr. Fraser. You can come and park yourself down here, please. Thank you, Hamish. Moderator, brothers, thank you. Uh, thank you too to the mission board. Um, Bob, the chairman, asked me to say a few words about St. Andrews, uh, where I have the privilege to minister. As I was thinking through what to share for um, encouragement, in many ways I found it dovetailing with much of what we've been saying. I I'm here for the second time as a commissioner at the assembly. I'm one who came somewhat late into the free church. And one of the great privileges and joys for me of the denomination generally, but my experience of the assembly both times, has been the chance to meet and hear from uh, brothers who are ministering in a whole range of different contexts. It's a privilege to meet and uh, hear about the joys and sorrows of ministry up on the north coast, the west coast, down in the borders, and where we are on the east. Uh, at the end of the day, the ministry we're all engaged in is that ministry of the word and prayer. And so when we speak of planting or revitalizing, we're talking about simply different modes of seeking to preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we speak of rural or urban, we're simply thinking again of different theatres in which we're seeking to preach the gospel, to make Christ known such that the Spirit might transform lives. So I just want for a couple of minutes to say a little bit about what that's looked like for us on the ground in St. Andrews for the last few years. We're privileged to have a lot of uh, students as part of the church family uh, and also to see a growing local congregation among us. Um, a couple of just stories or vignettes 
for you of, of where things have been going. We're constantly trying to say to our, our people there, often who are transient in St Andrews, coming in for three, four, five years, sometimes even one year, we're wanting to ask the question, given the gifts God has given you, how can you use them for his glory and not for your own? And we find that when we're pressing hard on that incredibly simple question, because at the end of the day, that's something that the scriptures shout from page one, isn't it? When we press hard on that, like a beach ball, when you press it under the water, it pops up in a range of, of different and very pleasing um, places. Uh, we're privileged this year to see six of our graduating class out of 15 uh, going into some form of formal ministry training to test the waters as to whether full-time Christian services for them. Three are staying with us in St Andrews. They'll be going to Cornhill in Glasgow and then uh, serving and getting training with ourselves. Three elsewhere, two for parachurch organisations committed to mission uh, and one working in a school down south in the south of England with an evangelical chaplain uh, seeking to make the gospel known to girls in a boarding house that she'll be working in. Uh, one of the most thrilling things though has been seeing people coming from no spiritual background whatsoever to not only profession in Christ and true faith but a a desire to serve him. Just a, a conversation a few weeks ago uh, with a young lady, I'll simply call her Elle. Uh, she's come from a very uh, privileged in the world's eyes, but actually behind the scenes, a very damaged family background, a history of abuse, uh, chronic battles with mental health, with self-harm. Wonderfully, she's come to know and trust in the Lord Jesus. This last year has been a, a testimony to the preserving grace of the Lord as she's fought uh, the good fight of faith in very difficult circumstances and was saying to me uh, I've come to a point where I realize I want to put Jesus first in every stage of life what does that look like as she's graduating and at the end of the conversation she said so what you're saying is I should find a church first where I'm going to hear the word and grow and then choose jobs around that is that what you're saying I said yeah pretty much and wonderfully she said great that's what I want to do and uh, and we prayed and two days later having been rejected from lots of journalism jobs she got offered a job in the place where she had located a church she wanted to be part of. Had to make clear to her, look, you know, it's not like this all the time. Uh, <laughs> the Lord's been very kind. He's given you your cake and you can eat it. It won't always be the case. Uh, but that's just a, a little snapshot of seeing how some students are changing. Uh, wonderfully, we had a, a young lady from the local area. Came into church just before Christmas. Uh, no background whatsoever uh, in Christianity. Simply said, I felt like I needed to go to church. And she's now professing faith in Christ and growing slowly with challenges. Um, but it's a wonderful thing, as we've heard already, to see how the Lord is working. And let me encourage all of us, whatever sphere of ministry we find ourselves in, as, as we think about ministry provision in cities or in the countries, every single one of us, whether we're a minister or an elder like myself, we have a wonderful opportunity and privilege and responsibility to teach God's word, uh, formally in preaching, in small groups, in one-to-one -one context, when we sit down for a, a coffee or a tea or whatever it is, to point people to Jesus and to then train within our own context. And um, it's very easy, I think, uh, I often in conversations, people say, oh, well, St. Andrews is weird. Um, of course, St. Andrews is weird. I mean, I, I could give you a list of how weird St. Andrews as a place is. Yet each and every one of us have people who love the Lord Jesus in our church families, who have been given gifts of grace and by the Holy Spirit, and whom under God we can then prayerfully seek to enable, to fan into flame those gifts that God has given them. Uh, our hope as a church locally is that we might provide for the church widely, as well as the free church here in Scotland, uh, men and women who can serve in ministry. It's a joy to see one of our young men who's done our ministry training scheme coming through to ETS next year and beginning as a part-time student. And we would long to be a, a resource church for the denomination in people. Uh, if not in finances. And I'd encourage us all to think, well, how can we best serve the apostolic preaching of the glorious gospel of God, however we are fitted, however we are gifted, whatever context we find ourselves in? Um, I'd love to, to talk more about that, about what that looks like on the ground for us, if that would be of any help. And thank you for your prayers. Um, and it's a privilege, again, to be part, as we've heard already, of a denomination where there is such commitment to multiplying the ministry of the word. That is a, a wonderful thing. And I have friends, as I close, moderator, who are in ministry down in England, uh, across the rest of the world, who, if they might not kill to be part of a denomination like this, they'd certainly commit some form of bodily harm to be in a, a group, a family of churches, whose driving desire is to make Jesus' name. Thank so, you. thank you. Thank you. The closer. Yes. It's a wonderful church. We get to drive Massey Ferguson's and preach the word of God undiluted.
Mr. Fries. Mr. Campbell. Uh, fathers and brethren, shalom. Uh, the Board of Trustees will put Massey Ferguson tractors on the agenda <laughs> of the June meeting. If that's what it takes to get rural ministry going, we'll buy Massey Ferguson tractors. Um, I want to begin by saying what a day of inspiration this has been from the first speaker from Malawi onwards. And honestly, guys, sitting there, it's been like climbing up to Pisca and staying there. So I hope I won't bring you down. <laughs> I'll try my best. First of all, let me say that in many ways, Derek, and I, 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 know, I don't know your first name, Dr. McKellar, but I think you're Dr. McKellar. Um, you've uh, expressed eloquently some of the things I wanted to say. Let me say something, first of all, about the Board of Trustees and Finances. We are emphatically not driven by finance. We want to be driven by vision, and we recognize that there is a faith entrepreneurialism that all Christians should have. So we're not driven by finance. We want to be driven by vision, but we need to be fed by the other committees, and we need to be fed by the congregations. It's very interesting listening to Malawi. Clearly, lots of whatever resources they have in that church, a lot of it's going to the center and it's been used centrally. We've kind of got to get back to deciding what is it we're comfortable to see congregations do with minimal central support and what we really need central support for because we can do these things better together. And when we have that vision, then we can go out to congregations and say, please give us more, please raise the tax by 5% five, five and so on. So we need to enthuse people. If they could only listen to what we listened to all morning and the speakers we've just had, I think that would go a long way and perhaps they are listening uh, to this. So we need to spend time thinking about this thing. We, as the Board of Trustees, we want you to keep hammering at our doors and telling us we should be doing things and spending money. That's not to say we'll say yes or say yes easily, but that's the kind of pressure we should be under uh, because we are only servants of the front line, and we are servants of the front line. So we need to be pressurized into providing and thinking of ways of providing what the church requires. That's my first one general point. My second is we seem to have got completely entangled between two quite different things. First of all, I think the myth perhaps has been shot to pieces. We support, we love planting, and I take my hat off to the people who are church planting. We support and we love revitalization, and I take my hat off to that. And please let us not be challenged every time we complain in one area that we're denigrating the other. We are not. It's a both and. <laughs> the second thing is the supply of ministry. I love the fact that so many students are going into assistantships. They'll come out much better trained as a result, and there'll be less casualties, and there'll be less setbacks, so it's a good thing. But we need to do something about the supply of ministers. And you know, we've got a great opportunity. We've, we're carrying 12 to 15 vacancies all the time. We need to get these vacancies filled now from out with our normal supply. We need to get people from elsewhere to come and do these vacancies. When they fill them, by the time they're filled, two or three years down the line, we'll have all these assistants now ready for their own charges. These are the church planters, the church revitalizers of a bigger, more impactful free church tomorrow. So think about it. Perhaps I haven't explained it well. Let people go into assistantships. Let us plug the gap now of the 12, and then we'll have all these people ready for more ministry, for more expansion in a year or two. And the better for having been assistants with godly people and learning the skills of dealing with people on the ground. These are skills you don't learn necessarily sitting in the seminary, but you do learn them when you're following somebody around to dust them. Now, let me say about rurality. I do believe we need to 
do things for rurality. It's a common problem. It's not just a church problem. We can't get dentists, we can't get doctors, we can't get policemen to live in rural areas. What is the solution to this? The best solution is to take the people who are in the rural areas and turn them into these people. They're living there already. They're more likely to work there. That's what drove the vision for UHI in the Highlands and Islands. That's why Glen Elg is going right now, because what's happening in Glen Elg is somebody who was already living in Glen Elg is now being prepared for ministry. So he will go back to Glenelg, God willing, because that's where he lives and that's where he wants to live. So we've got to do much more at congregational level to identify young men and challenge them to take up the call to be ministers because they are more likely to stay where they are uh, if they are trained there. People go away to cities. I went away to cities in a rural area. I was very happy to do so. Uh, but they don't have to. And nowadays, we have the technology to allow them to get training where they are. And talking of technology, I have been involved in a church revitalization. Our first minister was David Meredith. We never saw David in the flesh, but David preached to us every Sunday by the simple expedient then of a DVD. And that meant that for the first time, for some time, people were getting good, consistent teaching. And good, consistent teaching is transformational. And we can do that. I look at rurality and I say, people who live in rural areas, please be ready to change. And please embrace technology in a sensible way. There are great examples of the use of that technology in other areas. So I'm going terribly fast, but I'm nearly finished. Um, now, I just want to say a little about youth work, and I know I could be hoist badly on my own petard in this one, and Bob knows why. Um, but I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't more about education, except the failure of the person they asked to do something about education, uh, to which they refer to very kindly in the report. But I just want to say, we're in a situation now where we have three distinct strands going on in people's heads about education. One is homeschooling, two is setting up a Christian school, and three is using the state school. We've got to stop arguing about which is best because the fact of the matter is the people we interact with will be in all three areas, and we've got to work much, much harder to support them. Now, if I take the state school, and I'm not expressing a preference for one or t'other, I've no idea what I would do if I were a father now with young children. Um, the state school, the people who have no choice and who may exercise the choice to go to the state school, they need support. The teachers need support, the parents need support, and the children need support. Now, there are some parents who will say, and I ran into one at this assembly, I want my child to go to the state school to be a witness. That's a brave thing to say, but as a church, we are going to fail them badly if we don't prepare them and prepare the children for that witnessing experience. So I'm making a plea that we pay more attention in the forthcoming year to the whole education thing and to the three strands, home, private Christian education, and a two a state school education. And how we support them will be different, I think, from congregation to congregation, but I think we need to try. And lastly and finally, before the moderator slaps me down, uh, I'd love to see the CPD proposals in the report, but there's nothing about accountability. So I would ask you not merely to ask ministers to do these hours and keep the logbook, but get somebody to check the logbook and see that there's something in it at the end of the year. Because honestly, guys, in every organization, CPD logbooks are usually half empty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilkes, and then Mr. Campbell. And then you. Okay. Uh, as with several of the speakers, uh, Bob asked me to come and speak after this report, and possibly he's regretting that now. Um, I don't want to speak to what I was talking about on the amendment earlier. I want to go back to what I was going to say. Um, 
I want to tell you why I'm here. Um, I'm starting to get to know quite a few of you. You've heard me speak enough times over the last couple of days to have noticed that I did not grow up uh, on Lewis or indeed anywhere in Scotland. Um, I grew up in the Church of England um, and started exploring the possibility of ministry. Uh, and as I did so by a long and torturous road, um, I have ended up here and in, in the Free Church of Scotland. And I am so incredibly enthusiastic about that fact. And that is why I am so passionate to see us doing things well, because, you know, there's no zealot like a convert. I am a, such an enthusiastic Presbyterian. I want to encourage us all to be more Presbyterian in our outlook and in our behavior. It is so sad when uh, we have our discussions at Presbytery or here at the assembly uh, and we sound so congregationalist and so divisive, and it should not be the case. Brothers, let us love one another. Let us love our other fellow churches up and down this land. Uh, let us do that in our prayers and uh, as we come together, and let us do it practically too. Let me tell you um, some of my thinking on what that might look like for us in New Mills. Uh, we were given at the assembly last year uh, the uh, Mission Board Strategy Document, uh, and it has a number of wonderful proposals and great ambitions. Uh, one of those is, that's been alluded to a couple of times, this ambition to plant 30 new churches by 2030. Our denomination has in it six presbyteries. That therefore means, on average, each presbytery should be planting five new congregations. The Presbytery of Glasgow and Argyll has within it uh, four uh, area strategy groups. I am in the South Strategy Group, which is made up of six congregations, if I've counted them correctly. So we, as one of four strategy groups, we need to plant about 1.25 congregations uh, between the six of us. And that means we, as a congregation, need to plant about one-fifth of uh, a congregation, something like that. Now, clearly, we can't uh, plant one-fifth of a congregation on our own. And when we look at our congregation, we're not going to plant a church by 2030. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, by the grace of God, maybe it will. But what we can do is we can say, what can we do together as a South Area Strategy Group? What can we do together as a presbytery? So what I am proposing to take back to our deacon's court and take back to our Kirk session is uh, that we will identify in our budget um, that we will, our stated intention will be to agree a percentage that we devote to foreign mission and to agree a percentage that we devote to planting and revitalization uh, in Scotland that we state that that is our intention because we want to see this vision happen. And we are not so focused on ourselves here that we cannot look beyond and rejoice and encourage that growth. So that percentage to those targets and also uh, that we will uh, commit ourselves to encouraging at least two uh, families, couples, individuals to be willing to move into those contexts, to go with a church plant, to go into a difficult situation and support the minister in revitalization there. That's what I think it's gonna look like for us. For some of you, you need to be willing to admit that you need to be on the receiving end of that uh, rather than the sending end of that. Sometimes Presbyterian looks, Presbyterianism looks like asking for help instead of giving it. And sometimes our pride holds us back from doing that. Brothers, let us love one another as good Presbyterians. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, we're really perilously short of time, Mr. Campbell, if you can be very to the point. I know men from Lewis are always very to the point. And yes, indeed. Thank you. Very short. Well, shalom, shalom, shalom. indeed. And uh, moderator, congratulations and God's richest blessing on the days ahead as moderator and preacher. And that's from Garibost Free Church. And uh, moderator, friends and brothers, 
uh, I represent Garibald Free Church. And going around uh, the, the, the whole the assembly at this time, some people were asking about Garibald Free Church. And uh, uh, it's a united charge of the congregations of Knock and Point Free Church. And if you, if you have any questions, they're on page 107, paragraph 4, and page 108, appendix 1 of the Commission of Assembly in October, uh, which we uh, uh, a united charge. And I came here with thanks. Thanks to God, first of all. <clears throat> but um, first of all, I thank yourself, moderator, for helping us out at this time. Jerry Clamont, as moderator, been here, been with us. Bob has been helped, has helped us out. And many others, in the, even in the assembly at this time, have helped us out at this time. And uh, we're really thankful for their help. And uh, we are a con congregation with a mission and a vision for God's glory. And uh, we thank the, the presbytery and the whole church as a whole, because we've gone through quite a lot. And uh, we crave the church's prayers at this time. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Mr. Davis made this sign to me, and I think I also need to take Tom Muir. And yeah, we'll, we'll have this, the Spaniard from Coeco uh, as well. Moderator, thank you very, very much. Uh, I just want to say uh, a couple of things very briefly. First point, I just want to take the opportunity on behalf of the House to pay tribute to the work of Sarah Johnston and to thank you very much. <laughs> Sarah does a huge, huge amount uh, and in many ways it, it goes very, very unnoticed. So thank you so, so much for that. Uh, also, just a wee, one comment I would like to, to just uh, say, perhaps uh, in your summing up, Bob, uh, we are very excited about Generation, and uh, we're really looking forward to the opportunity uh, for sharing this with our congregations um, this coming weekend. Uh, but as with many of us here, we have, we have a wide range of, of people in our congregations. Um, we have some people uh, who, are, um, uh, who are younger and who, who, who will, I think, grasp this, this concept very, very easily. Uh, but for others, uh, it, it may be something that, that will take a little bit more explanation. So in your summing up, a few words of just, just guidance for how we could best, you know, because I want everybody in Carloway on Sunday night to be really excited about generation. So a couple of words about that would be, be, would be really, really good. Um, the word generation for me, uh, I love very much as a former engineer because it makes me think power stations. Uh, and uh, I, uh, one of the things that, uh, 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 one of the lessons we can learn from the wonderful world of power stations, where I, I used to work from time to time, is the fact that every power station in the country is connected to the national grid. Uh, nothing is working on its own. Uh, no one's just providing for their own uh, area. Everyone's just feeding into the national grid. Uh, and I think that's really, uh, I hope, a good illustration of, of, of where we are uh, as a denomination. We're all working in very different contexts, but we're feeding into that, that grid. Uh, in Carloway, we uh, are feeding into that grid I suppose uh, we make two uh, contributions. We're, we're, we're trying to pray. So we pray every Sunday morning for another congregation in the Free Church. We ask for prayer points for people. That's been a great thing. Uh, and we try our very best to give. Um, uh, and I, I, have a, I have a wonderful deacon's court and a wonderful treasurer. Uh, this is not my doing, and so I'm not, I don't want this to come across as, as, as boasting because I've got nothing to do with it. Uh, but we agreed as a deacon's court uh, to give a thousand pounds a month to the mission fund as a standing order, which we did. After a few months, my treasurer came to me and he says, we can afford to give more. Mm. So we put it up to 1,200. Um, and as I said, that's not me. That's, my, that's, that's the godly men that I am blessed to have with me uh, in Carloway. Uh, and we are so thankful that we were able to do that. And that's why when I hear about uh, Tom uh, in Esk Valley, uh, or when I hear uh, about... Uh, Ali in Haddington or Neil at Cornerstone, I get really excited because we're part of that too. Thanks. Tom Muir, and I, I think Martin Cunningham probably will have to be the last speaker as well. 
Moderator, thank you, fathers and brethren. Thank you to the board uh, and everybody involved for all the work that went into that. So, uh, I'm a church planter. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm called, anyway. But I grew up in the free church, and I've been in many of the congregations which you represent, and I love them all. And uh, I'm encouraged by the way in which, when I come to the assembly, I can speak with old friends, and we meet and we hear about each other's congregations, and it does us good. And one of the things that I'm very convicted by is the fact that I take the congregation which I represent now, Esk Valley, which is a baby of the Free Church now, uh, and I get to introduce this new congregation, many of whom, most of whom, have no idea about the Free Church, and I get to introduce them to the denomination which I represent as a minister. So they get to hear about rural ministry, and they get to hear about city ministry, and it's a blessing, and I want the congregation which I represent to be deeply concerned about all the different aspects uh, of the denomination's life, and I think that's what we've been expressing together this afternoon. Essentially, Esk Valley is a congregation which started with about six people and a few kids about three years ago. We now have around 50 people. I'm really encouraged by that. Uh, it's, uh, I also want to say that in many ways, all we do is what you do. We, we just meet together for fellowship, we build one another up, and we seek to find out ways in which we can help those who are coming into our church understand what on earth we're talking about so that they may know Jesus and go out with helpful, clear, loving ways to connect to people so that they can start to hear what we're talking about and so that they can may hear about Jesus. Uh, I noticed in this uh, very helpful booklet, this little quote about the middle of the booklet, according to 2016 Free Church Statistics, only 60% of Kirk Sessions feel they train their members to be missional, make disciples, or engage in outreach. 60% sounds like a good amount in some ways. However, it ties in with something I've been thinking about a lot, which is this one question that I, I've been thinking about for myself and I want to help our people think through. I'm trying to boil down what we do as much as possible and try and make it uh, as clear and as helpful for them as possible. So that the task of forming a new church, the task of going out and making discipleships, uh, making disciples is something that we can feel engaged in together, not intimidated by. And the question is this, if God's call for us is to become disciples who make disciples, what does that look like for each one of us this year? Just a simple question, it considers the Great Commission and it enables the congregational members to ask one another that question and indeed to encourage one another and to pray for one another. And I think that question applies, in my experience, in the city ministry I've been a part of, I'm sure it applies in rural ministry, in regenerations, in world mission, in all kinds of ways. And it's really exciting to be able to consider that question together, uh, sharing our experiences, building one another up, uh, and it's a great blessing to be a part of the assembly. And I just want to covet your prayers, please, for our baby congregation, which is still learning to walk, which has many troubles, uh, but we're encouraged as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shalom, Martin. I don't know what the Spanish for shalom is. Uh, moderator fathers and brothers, um, Martin Cunningham, Loch Broom and Koyoch, hola, buenos dias. Um, I just want to speak on a few moments on a bit of a hobby horse of mine, and it's mentioned on page 58 of the, the report, and that is sabbaticals. Um, tomorrow we're going to hear from Reverend Nigel Anderson about World War I and the Free Church, and as many of you know, World War I was a, a time of great change. Uh, in our nation, a great military change as well, because what they learned was how to deal with the effects of being on the front line, the effects on the soldiers on the front line. Um, and they learned to, that they had to uh, uh, rotate soldiers to take them off the firing line, to take them off the front lines, and take them on the back lines and uh, give them some rest and change uh, what they were doing. What about our front lines? Who's on our front lines? More than anything, more than anyone, it's our pastors, it's our ministers. They're the ones who are taking the hits. They're ones who are taking all the pressure. They're ones who are having to cope with more and more um, 
legislation and uh, dealing with not just their own family lives, but, uh, but all the, pre the pressure of their congregations as well as everything else. I have the, the dubious pleasure of, of sharing a flat with this assembly with three uh, ministers. Uh, these three ministers between them have uh, over 60 years of gospel service. Uh, not one of them have taken a sabbatical in that time. And I was wondering, uh, of all the ministers we have in this room, how many have taken a sabbatical if you add up all the years that they have worked. Um, is it a coincidence that there's so, ma so many levels of illness and depression within our ministers because we're not, they're not resting properly? Um, so I want to make an appeal to my fellow elders that we need to look after our ministers, that we need to encourage them if, they've, if they're entitled to it once they've, they've, they've done their seven years plus of service uh, to, if, to take a a sabbatical. And I know what you're wondering, how does that work out practically? What about my family? Uh, what about supply and all the other aspects of it? Uh, one thing that was suggested to me uh, was uh, pulpit swaps. Pulpit swaps with some of the connections with congregations that we have and churches that we have maybe in the States or, or elsewhere. These things can be worked out. And I think it's proper and good for us to look after our pastors, to offer them rest, to take them off the front lines of gospel service for a time, and so that they can recharge their batteries and be renewed and refreshed. So I want to appeal to my fellow elders to consider that. Mm -hmm. Can I make three very quick thank yous, moderator? Uh, thank you uh, for the missions board for this report. Uh, it really opens my eyes. Uh, to all the work that has been done and uh, 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 throughout the church. So thank you for that. And thank you also to the Missions Board for uh, releasing Lachie to, from South Uist to come to uh, Loch Broom and Coyoch. We really do appreciate that. Uh, one more thank you on behalf of my congregation. I should have done this yesterday, but I, I bottled it a little bit. Um, uh, that is a thank you to uh, the Vice uh, Chairman, of the uh, Trustees Commission, Carl MacDonald. Carl has been a great help to our congregation in the last year, and we really, really do appreciate it. Um, amongst everything else that he does for his own congregation, for the presbytery, for our presbytery, and for the church at large, he stepped in when our treasurer moved away and really helped us out uh, and did the treasury work for the last year for us. So, Carl, thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias, senor. I think I'll ask the chairman to reply. He, I'm sure, will be brief. And if there are things that he needs to maybe write to people about, he can maybe do that after the rising of the assembly. Thank you. Well, can I just say to everyone who has taken part in the discussion, the debate, whether asking questions, attempting to move amendments, speaking, uh, we are grateful at the mission board for your input. I found every comment, every speech constructive and positive, so thank you very much. Uh, just to generally, to sum up, to say that we do recognize that we always need to communicate better, to communicate better to you as commissioners, to communicate better to the wider church, to communicate better to the board of trustees. Some of my best friends are trustees. Uh, and to and I think generation is one vehicle for better communication. Thomas was asking for a few words. Just very simply, along with the brochures that will be going to all the congregations, some of you may have already ordered your brochures. They're available that, to be picked up in the offices. Others will be sent. And along with those will be a cover letter for myself on behalf of the mission board explaining what generation is and why we have taken the, these steps. I want to say uh, thank you for, uh, to, to Benjamin for the, for the amendment that he proposed. We are listening at the mission board. We listen to the church. We are your servants. We want to serve the church well, and we want to serve all aspects of the church well. We will be in further communication with the board of trustees. James Fraser is asking us to bang at the door so that the trustees can spend more money. So we will be one of those who will be knocking at that door. Others too, I 
hope we'll, we'll likewise be seeking funding for various projects. But we are listening and we are responding and we are seeking to provide leadership and guidance and vision based on the vision that we've already been given. So I wanna be, I am grateful to you all. It's a wonderful board to be a part of. Uh, we do hope to expand our team, as we mentioned in, in, the, in the deliverance. Nathan Olson, just to say that Nathan, we're grateful for his input. Nathan is self-funded, so he costs us nothing. He is going to be with us for another year and a half. He's been with us for two and a half years. So we recognize his, the value of his work, but we recognize that we need even further input, and especially from someone who has been planting here within the Free Church and within Scotland. So moderator and fathers and brethren, I want to thank you all for your kindness today and for your enthusiasm in mission. And we, your mission board. One question for you, Dr. Ackroyd. Are you minded to accept the oh, I addendum? I meant to say that at the very outset, yes. Uh, Roddy, we are delighted to accept uh, the addendum and, and to make that part of our report. You're all happy that the convener should do that? And are we pleased to take uh, Mr. Uh, Lamont's suggestion that that a, a, a committee can be convened of which uh, Mr. Rankin can be a member. Thank you. In that case, I believe that that becomes the finding of the House. That is agreed. So thank you to the convener and those who moved and seconded and all who took part in what I thought really was a very helpful, very constructive debate. We have gone a little bit over time, uh, but then that happens. And I'm sure it was, it was for our good. So uh, do we have time to take up the report of the Ecumenical Relations Committee before the order of the day? Delegates from South Korea haven't arrived. They were, they'll be here for four o'clock. Okay. So we can at least uh, present the report and move the report if we can. Jolly good. Uh, is it Mr. Meredith that appears for the Ecumenical Relations Meredith. report? Moderator, fathers and brethren, you will find the report of the Ecumenical Relations Committee on page 73. Mark Twain wrote, Mark Twain, by the way, was the Presbyterian. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow-mindedness and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. So that's a great launch pad for an ecumenical mindset that we as a denomination in our very DNA have never lodged in one little corner of the earth. As you see there, Thomas Chalmers was one of the founders of the EA, the Free Church of Scotland. In its best days, I've always had a, a Catholicity of spirit. And few things are as enriching as mixing with people who do things differently, as well as people who do things uh, in a similar way and yet operate in different contexts. I think the insecure find engagement with other people fearful and stressful. But those who are winsomely confident in their own theological skins revel and learn in the company of others. And I hope that we have that winsome uh, confidence in our own theological skin. And I hope that a culture of gracious engagement characterizes the culture of our ecumenical activity. I'll be brief, just some highlights of last year and some issues for discussion. Um, highlights are purely personal, but we are enjoying our links with the PCI, the Presbyterian Church of Ireland. And again, this is a fascinating denomination which is becoming increasingly um, reformed in its trajectory. So it's somewhat unusual for a mixed denomination, but that is the direction of travel. The Northern Ireland context has some similarities to ours, and there's a real scope for mutual learning 
and encouragement. Uh, believe it or not, they are impressed by our church planting experience and aspirations, and they want to hear more about that. And we have been impressed by their church revitalization ministries, and we want to learn more about that. Uh, it was a pleasure recently, personally, to be in uh, Union Road Presbyterian Church in, in Macrafelt and to witness that expanding congregation in a small town uh, context. We often look to the USA for interesting models, but in the, U uh, the UK um, there are marvellous examples which are perhaps more realistic and culturally embedded within our own context. We also enjoyed our meetings with uh, what we call EPQ, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Eng England and Wales, and uh, IPC, the International Presbyterian Church. We had a very uh, candid morning of discussion with these two groupings, and we hope that these meetings will be held at least annually. Again, few things are as helpful as being in the room with people and talking with folk to read the mood music, to observe the body language, and to talk to one another. The recent uh, visit of Patrick Jock was another highlight. Uh, it reveals a change in mind and strategy, and it's related to our uh, mission board work also. We now relate to majority world churches as partners. So the old model was somewhat imperialistic, to be frank. Uh, and now we engage with churches in Africa, India, Latin America, and Asia as colleagues from whom we can learn, not as children who need to be guided. There does come a point in life when you sit down with your own children and they say, Dad, it's not like that anymore, and you learn from them as well as them learning from you. Uh, and Patrick Jock, to hear of churches growing in a church planting movement in South Sudan, uh, many of you heard him amidst that context, was humbling. And so that's an example of how ecumenical relations have now reached international. We would love to engage more, but engagement costs money. And uh, we've had to cut back because of a somewhat reduced uh, budget. We, we will be knocking at the door of the trustees and there's going to be a long line of uh, people knocking at that door. I'll just talk about issues that you may want to discuss. Um, a younger generation engage ecumenically in a different way. Uh, our younger ministers tend to be more ecumenically involved through things like Acts 29, City to City, 20 Schemes, Local Gospel Partnerships. You see the trend. So the younger generation want to be involved in ecumenical movements that lead to action. Um, they say, and I'm just quoting what they say, that the classic ecumenical devices like RCRC, WRF, even EA, to quote one younger minister said they are, quote, peopled by old white grey-haired men in suits. So as an old, white, grey-haired man in suits who is involved in many of these things, but they've got a point. Uh, so we've got to ask ourselves, why are the younger ministers not uh, engaged in that? And, but then we've got to say, well, actually they are engaged in ecumenical activity, but just in, in a different way, action as opposed to talk. So people are frustrated at ICRC, for example, um, it's a conference, it's a talk shop. And my personal experience of it has not been all that positive. However, from ICRC came the link with Patrick Jock. So like everything, it is what you make of it. So we're interested to hear from you. Uh, what works, what should we be doing, who should we be talking to, how should the talking be done, what's happening uh, locally. So, moderator, with these few words, I have great pleasure in presenting and moving the report of the Ecumenical Relations Committee. Any questions for Mr Meredith? Yes, Mr Kelleher. Here.
moderator. Shalom. Uh, for those of you brothers, for those of you who don't remember me, my name's Kieran Callagher. I'm an elder at St. Andrews. And my accent might betray me, but I'm an Irishman and a very proud Irishman, a Munsterman and a Limerick man. Uh, it's wonderfully encouraging to hear. I, I've been hearing stories from Ireland about the uh, the movement uh, and the trajectory of the PCI. So that's wonderfully encouraging. Uh, it was nice to hear about the EPCI yesterday, uh, but they are um, concentrated in Northern Ireland, so it's lovely to hear about uh, a denomination that's plugged into the Republic of Ireland. I was just wondering, just a question, is what um, steps will be taken? Where does the, what steps do the PCI need to keep moving towards where we as a denomination could have formal links uh, with them? Uh, what's, what's the kind of movement, what's the steps that need to be taken? So, so a, a great question. We already have formal links. Um, the bilateral meetings that have been organised are formal. Um, you know, you're hearing about them there. The PCI General Assembly voted on them last year. We thought it, and, and I, we had a meeting with the PCI, and we thought it was of limited value to have simply an exchange of moderators. That in a sense is symbolic and it's good to have visits, but both they and we wanted to go deeper. They also have um, some uh, sensibilities in, in Northern Ireland, especially as they related formerly to another Presbyterian church in Scotland and the ties to that church are becoming somewhat less and to us somewhat more, but that is a, a sensitive situation and not one that should concern us. It's a good Here's question, thank you. Another question? Anybody? Hmm. Perhaps I should tell you that I was at an at a exalted banquet last night. I avoided the third sederant yesterday and uh, managed to spend a few minutes speaking on an ecumenical basis with Archbishop Leo Cushley. He's a very charming man, and he, he informed me that he once went for coffee with uh, David Robertson. He never got the coffee. Um, he had a three-hour discussion with David Robertson. I'm not sure if the Archbishop ever got to say his whole name in those three hours, but I believe the conversation was very enlightening. Uh, so um, I don't know why I told you that, but there you go. <laughs> Moderator, uh, the Principal Clark is going to second it. Thank you. Moderator, fathers and brethren, this is a report of the Ecumenical Relations Committee. It's actually the first report of the reconstituted committee. Uh, and this is my first experience of life on this committee. Uh, and I want to share something of what I've learned uh, from a year on the committee and perhaps to do so that to, in order to encourage us to be more involved in this area of activity for the church. And I want to focus on three things that I've learned myself and that I hope will encourage us to focus on this matter. First of all, I want to speak about our identity. Our engagement in ecumenical activities is not an option. It is a reflection of our identity and DNA as a body of believers. We belong to the Catholic Universal Church the wider community of the covenant people of God throughout the world. The words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians and in chapter 4 are like our Magna Carta, a guide and a handbook concerning what is essential in the unity of the Church of Christ and how we are to act in order to promote that unity. And as we read the Magna Carta, Paul reminds us of the unity of the Church of Christ, that it is spiritual. He reminds us that the unity of the Church is the basis for all ecclesiastical life. He reminds us that the unity of the church is both theological and confessional, and he reminds us that there is diversity in the unity of the church. And our identity as the branch of the church of Jesus Christ in the world and the unity of Christ's church demands that we are engaged in ecumenical activities. We have a biblical mandate and a duty of brotherly love and care to Christians out with our own denomination and to cultivate relations for fellowship and mutual support with other churches. It is in the very essence of shalom uh, that it extends and is extended to others. Uh, ecumenical activity is to do with our identity. Secondly, it has to do with our interaction. 
The unity that is the essence of our identity is what inspires us in our interaction with other denominations and organizations. We seek to develop gospel partnerships, share in gospel ministry, developing our understanding of the doctrine of the unity of the church as we work together towards the ultimate biblical goal of the actual unity of the church. It is our New Testament mandate to seek, by all legitimate means, a greater understanding amongst the Lord's people with a view to greater cooperation and praying that the Lord will one day unite his church around his infallible and inerrant word. If the unity of the church is our inspiration for ecumenical relations activities, then the diversity of the church, which I think the community has referred to, is the challenge that we face as we play our part in working towards the ultimate goal of the actual unity of the church. We have our confessional parameters which guide us along in our interaction and engagement with other denominations and organizations, looking through and beyond the differences in individual churches and theologies we have to return to talking about, as Paul does in Ephesians 4, God, Christ, faith, and baptism. If we want to participate in seeking to achieve the biblical goal of the unity of the church, we return to these four points again and again, God, Christ, faith, and baptism. And this interaction with the other denominations and organizations has a double benefit. It is in itself the means of further inspiration for ecumenical relations. It is also the means of reinforcement of our sense of identity as part of the Church of Jesus Christ in the world. And these double benefits are uh, discovered by us uh, the more we are engaged in this activity. And the Karina has already referred to the various meetings that we ha have had during the year. And he did mention the importance of being in the room. Uh, and he mentioned around Patrick Jock. And I think everyone who met Patrick will understand how we're all inspired by all that he said as he spoke about the context in which he is doing his ministry, as he spoke about the civil war in South Sudan, as he spoke about his personal safety, the displacement of the people of South Sudan, and as a convener referred to, uh, the development and growth of the church in that part of the world. But in one conversation with Patrick Jock, Patrick, I think, hit the central nerve of the church as a body of unified uh, members. When asked how did he feel at times in his ministry, and he said, sometimes I feel that we are alone. But then he went on to say, but tonight I know that we are not. Mm. And I think that sums it up. And we all know that in the mystery of God's providence, personally, we can feel alone. And in the mystery of the providence of God, that's where God has taken us, and we cannot do anything about that. But the sense in which Patrick speaks about being alone, we can do something about it. And we can do that by helping to ensure that others do not feel alone. We cannot be alone ourselves. We cannot simply think about what we are doing. And we cannot allow others to feel alone and isolated in their own context and ministry. The goal of visible unity is to be kept in mind constantly. We must really declare it out loud whenever it seems to be furthest from us. If the unity of the church is not always in our minds, we have forgotten Christ's prayer that his disciples might all be one. We need to be reminded continually of the importance of this activity. The unity of the church must be talked about, written about, sung about. This unity must be understood as much as possible and meditated upon, thought about, prayed about, exhorted and sought in our everyday lives. It must have hands and legs as well as heart. And finally, that leads to something that the Korean has already touched on. It leads to our investment. Our ecumenical relations activities arise out of our identity. The natural expression of our identity is to have a meaningful interaction with other denominations and organizations. The indispensable expression of our identity and its associate interaction with others requires investment. There is, of course, a financial implication. We can engage prayerfully, which is of vital importance. We can engage through regular correspondence, but surely our ecumenical relations have to be incarnational if they are to be in the least bit, bit meaningful. After all, everything to do with the body of Christ is incarnational. And being incarnational, as we know, is costly. 
Our inspiration for investment is God's investment in establishing the foundation of his church, the investment to which attention is drawn by Paul himself, where we are drawn near by the blood of Christ, and where he has broken down the wall and made us both one. And in closing, as a secondary report, I do want to plea, make a plea for greater investment in times of strict budgeting and financial control, and perhaps in time when we have more money in the bank that we, than we have had in the past. Could I, on behalf of this committee, make a plea for more investment in this area of the ministry of the church? Currently, we have £4,000 in, in the budget for our committee. Uh, 1.75k of that is taken up with annual fees. Uh, there are committee expenses on top of that, so we are left with a figure of less than £2,000 to carry out meaningful ecumenical relations. So I do appeal uh, to uh, the Board of Trustees especially to consider further investment in this area of the important ministry of the work. And in uh, closing, perhaps uh, I could mention that it does give me great, great joy to have my personal friend, Pastor Yang Bo Kim, and his friends from Korea today. Pastor Kim has visited us in, in the Isle of Lewis on more than one occasion. He has also uh, spent his 25th anniversary on the Isle of Lewis. He, he knows his way around, and we are pleased that he and his friends are here uh, today, and perhaps we'll hear something more uh, from them later. I want to have a pleasure in seconding the report. Thank you very much. So that uh, report has been moved and seconded. Are there any speakers to this report? Yes, we'll begin with uh, Mr. McLeod from Leith. Uh, okay, other hands? Yes, very good. So we'll have Roger Crooks afterwards, and then we'll have you, Grant. It's good to have speakers to this report. Doesn't always get speakers. Moderator, thank you. I thought if I wore my Rangers tight today, I'd get in with a shout eventually. Uh, ecumenical. What a word. In my experience, it's messy, challenging, and hard. Uh, and I would like to just extend uh, or commend to the House and the ministry of our church an uh, ecumenical experience that is absolutely superb, and it costs nothing. It will cost the church not a penny. So any trustees listening now should be writing about this. It will not cost the church a penny. You will have an outstanding ecumenical experience that, you will, that will live with you for the rest of your life and you'll bring back to the church as I have done. I am talking about military chaplaincy. If you were to consider in your heart God's calling, could I please uh, ask you to think of the Royal Army Chaplains Department. I won't mention the Navy and I'm certainly not going to mention the RAF. They're just out there somewhere, but I can talk about the Army all day, which of course I don't have. But I'd just like to say the last team of chaplaincy that I was part of, 12 Armoured Infantry Brigade down there in Salisbury before I finished my 12 years of service, the team consisted of a Baptist, a Methodist, two Anglicans, a Church of Scotland and a Church of the Nazarene. That was my team. For their sins, I was the team leader. It was brilliant. I spent every day telling them how wrong they were and how right I was. And the biggest challenge of all was that the Church of Scotland guy from Northern Ireland was a Celtic fan. <laughs> Every extra duty that came my way landed on his desk. <laughs> That's what being ecumenical is all about, looking after the weaker and bringing them toward the light. <laughs> I would extend to you, think about it, the Royal Army Chaplains Department was absolutely tremendous to hear in your own address, moderator, and I mentioned a military chaplaincy. A uh, hundred years ago now, a hundred years ago, right now, the British Army was fighting for its life and existence as the German forces pushed back, and it looked bad. It looked really bad. And within about a month and a half of where we are right now, a hundred years ago, they managed to turn the tide, and what became known as a hundred days of victory followed up to Armistice Day, November 11th. In that time, countless fatalities countless injuries, life-changing injuries, and in there in the mix of it all, chaplains, padres with their units, where the men were. And that is the best thing about being a chaplain. Any chaplaincy is workplace ministry. You go where they go. In the current context, that will mean Iraq or Afghanistan, but you will go where they go. It's tremendous. You get to work with people who begin the weekend on a Friday night by fighting. If they're not fighting, it's a bad weekend. 
but they need you there on a Monday. And if you're amongst them, they will turn to you and you as their chaplain have the opportunity to influence them, shape them, mould them, lead them. I commend to the Ministry of the Royal Army Chaplains Department. Thank you very much. Roger Crooks. Moderator uh, Brothers, uh, Roger Crooks, Minister for Campbelltown. Uh, this time last year, I was a very happy minister in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Uh, now I'm a happy minister in the Free Church of Scotland. And it's, I want to commend you for trying to encourage uh, and have relations with the uh, PCI to encourage the growing reform tra trajectory in the PCI. It is a big encouragement. We, in Northern Ireland, we have great affinity with Scotland, um, and as our relationship with the CFS unraveled, it was good to see the Free Church coming uh, to, to keep that reformed uh, emphasis and keep us on the right track. And I just want to keep encouraging uh, that to come. And, and I, I know that Mr. Meredith said about uh, deeper relations in that there, but um, I would love to see it someday that the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland would be uh, at uh, our General Assembly here. In Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Trevor, Trevor Kane, I think you're next. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Okay. So Mr. Kane will be the last speaker before we have the order of the day. Twice in one day, Mr. Moderator. Hopefully this will be the last time. Sadly, it falls to me not to share the enthusiasm of my previous speaker and indeed my fellow colleague in uh, the Glasgow and Argyle Presbytery regarding the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Please turn with me to page 75 of the Ecumenical Relations Committee, item two. We read about the suspension of the Reformed Church of the Netherlands liberated from the ICRC on the basis of their decision to admit women to ordained office. We note, more importantly, that this is contrary to the teaching of the Bible on the report. Is that correct and factual? But yet on page 73 of the report, we're encouraging relations with a denomination that promotes exactly the same thing. Now, to me, they are two contradictory positions. Uh, and I offer that merely as a comment uh, and perhaps as a, a counter to the, uh, to the positive reports that we've heard. I mean, what's the point in being an Ulster man if you can't be, if you can't be negative? Absolutely. Thank you, Maureen. I'm grateful to you, Mr. Kane. We, we do have a similar developing relationship with the PCA in Australia, which is a denomination that uh, in the 60s, was very much along the lines of uh, modernist and liberal churches that has come back and has actually reversed its policy on the ordination of women. Um, and, and not found that easy, but has, has, has done that because they have found it to be biblical. And it may be that through having talks and interaction with uh, churches that we correspond with, that we can influence them. I hope we can influence our brethren in Holland as well um, it, is, it is very disappointing that the liberated uh, denomination in Holland has taken the step that it has. Um, but I hope that by communicating with them and explaining why it is difficult to have a close partnership, um, that we can make uh, an influence on sister churches and on churches that we correspond with. But your point is well made and we, we accept it. So that was the last speaker, and so I believe that with your agreement, that report is received and adopted. Yes? So we now have an order of the day. We have visitors joining us. Oh, yes, I beg your pardon. Yes, of course, reply. I was replying on your behalf there, Mr. <laughs> uh, Moderator, thank you for the speakers. It's very, very brief replies. Um, Con McLeod... Uh, when he stood up, I thought, at last, a, a ranger supporter who's not a bigot. <laughs> and then he opened his mouth. 
Other services are available, Navy, RAF, but we are so thankful to Colin for his service in military chaplaincy. We prayed for him and uh, he did encourage other folk to consider that. So please take him up on the offer, uh, speak to him about military chaplaincy. Colin did a sterling job there and uh, I'm sure uh, he's, he, I think he's still involved in the territorials and every blessing to him. We are so encouraged by Roger Crooks, and that is in Campbellton. Again, we were praying for Campbellton for many years, and for a minister of the PCI of such stature as Mr. Crooks um, to go there, again, is an encouragement. And uh, a real seal of the growing links that we have with the PCI. Mr. Kane, what can we say? Um, there are dramatic and fundamental differences between the Liberated Church uh, and the PCI in terms of our relationship with them. Number one, we had fraternal relations with the Liberated Church through the ICRC. Uh, and they were going, the Liberated Church is going sadly in one trajectory, to use that, that word, which we are disappointed with. The Presbyterian Church of Ireland is entirely different, wonderfully different. So we have, in administrative terms, we have contact with them. Are we really going to not talk to folk that we don't agree with? And here we have a denomination which, as it develops, is becoming more reformed, more evangelical. They are egalitarian in theory, but the number of females applying for their ministry is reducing and reducing and reducing to almost a trickle. We as a denomination are going to reach out our hand warmly and we are going to encourage them in that direction. And I would resist anything that would move our relationship from the PCI to anything that is less than warm. So that is a growing relationship and it will grow uh, even stronger in the days ahead. No church is perfect and uh, if folk are going the right direction they need encouragement and not discouragement and that's certainly the message of this General Assembly and uh, our Ecumenical Relations Committee. Uh, but thanks to all the speakers and uh, every blessing in your work. Thank you very much. Yes, it, uh, it's good to have uh, some speeches on, on some topics. Some uh, years we've had no debate at all on this matter, so I'm very glad we had some discussion and debate. I'm going to ask you now if you could uh, lead us through the, the next item of business, and that's the presentation of some guests, some delegates to the assembly. Yes, moderator. Um, again, we are delighted to welcome uh, some more guests to us. And first of all, we were expecting the Reverend Ken Sing Lee from Singapore this morning, but he is now with us. And if you would make your way uh, out, Mr. Lee. Uh, I first came across the Presbyterian Church of Singapore in South Wales, as you would expect. <laughs> and I formed a relationship there with Reverend Cho, and that was followed up by a visit by Dr. Nichols, John Nichols, uh, to Singapore in his moderatorial year, and I am now delighted to introduce uh, the Reverend Ken Sing Lee to you from the Presbyterian Church of Singapore. Mr. Lee, welcome to the General Assembly and welcome to Edinburgh. We're delighted to have you with us today. And I would invite you to bring greetings to the house. First of all, I must apologize for not uh, being present earlier in the day. Uh, I only noticed in the program sheet that I was supposed to be here in the morning. Uh, so my apology. I send you greetings from the Presbyterian Church in Singapore. I just want to say that as I sat there uh, listening to the debates on, on the mission, mission report, uh, I'm just so delighted to hear that you are so passionate about the Great Commission. Um, you know, church revitalization, church building, and people inviting friends into um, church, and people coming to know the Lord Jesus. 
Um, praise the Lord for the good work that you're doing. Um, well, in Singapore, we, we take we, the, the Singaporean church, uh, I think not just the Presbyterian church, but the churches in Singapore on the whole, we take the Great Commission very seriously, um, going uh, to the people outside of the church community to share the gospel, uh, equipping our people as well. Um, you know, we just don't tell them, go and share the gospel, but we equip them to, to share. Uh, we equip them to know how to steer conversations towards spiritual matters, so that we can you know, talk about God in a very natural way. Uh, we, we are a multiracial society, so we are surrounded by Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists. Um, more than 50% of our population are Buddhists. Uh, but we thank God that our government, um, they, they don't restrict us in terms of the sharing of our faith, and people can convert um, you know, to different religion, and it's not illegal. And so we can be at the, in the street just sharing the gospel and we're okay. Um, and so the, the challenge for us is really to equip our people uh, so that sharing the gospel is part and parcel of, of, their, of their life. Uh, so whether they are in the um, workplace, in their school, um, as the Holy Spirit opens the opportunity for them to share the gospel, uh, you know, we will encourage them to do that. Um, we are also um, pretty strong in terms of community engagement, meaning serving the people in our community. Uh, we, we want to do that because we want to obey Christ's command to love our neighbours as ourselves. Uh, but it is also in engaging them that we have the opportunity to share the gospel. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a, that part about going, baptising, and then teaching, teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded. So... Uh, you know, I, I tell my, my church members that the building part, the teaching part, cannot just rest on the minister or the elders only. Everybody, everybody in the pew can be involved in building each other up. And it could really be, you know, just talking about the Word of God after sermon. It could be just sharing what God has been doing in our lives for the past week and be lending um, a shoulder for people to cry on, listening and then encourage them, encourage them with the word of God. Or it could also be speaking truth into their life and sometimes a word of rebuke. And so we, we tell them that all of us, all of us, we, we have a responsibility to build each other up. Yeah. And I, as I sit there, I'm hearing that you're also doing the same thing here. And so it gives me a lot of encouragement. And I just want to say, uh, let's you know, continue to, to keep up the good work for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Moderator. I'd also now like to introduce uh, the Reverend Robin uh, Tso from the Presbyterian Church of Eastern Australia, a church with whom we have the closest uh, ecumenical ties, in fact, the only other denomination in which we have mutual eligibility of ministers. Moderator, please meet Mr. So, you're very welcome to the General Assembly. Thank you for coming such a long way. I understand you're taking one of our ministers away with you yes. in your luggage when you leave. Maybe not quite as Hopefully soon as more. that. But, <laughs> but we wish uh, Reverend John Forbes and his family the Lord's blessing as they go to serve with you and with your church. Thank you. uh, we have such a long partnership with the Presbyterian Church of Eastern Australia. Please address the General Assembly. Well, moderator, fathers and brethren, and uh, it is indeed a great honour and joy to be here to address you today and to bring greetings to your General Assembly. On behalf of my home denomination, the Presbyterian Church of Eastern Australia, and it is so wonderful to see some familiar faces, uh, and it is indeed, uh, while standing here among you, is a humbling reminder of the providential hand of the Lord to myself personally. I can remember vividly in this very place, sitting upstairs in the gallery, and at that very point, I was a private student of what was then the Free Church College and a candidate for the Church of Scotland. And so in many ways, uh, this visit to Scotland and to the Free Church to me, it seems like a homecoming. And it is in this land 
where I felt my sense of call to the ministry challenged and confirmed again and again, and many friendships formed for life. And now, nine years on, it is truly a great privilege for myself to come as a delegate from the Synod of Eastern Australia. And indeed, it has been disappointing that the PCEA has not been sending a delegate until now, as the last time was back in 2010. And so for those who may not be familiar with the Presbyterian Church of Eastern Australia, we are a small denomination on the eastern seaboard of Australia. And we have 13 congregations from Brisbane and Queensland in the north, all the way down to Alfriston in Tasmania in the south. And indeed, our charges, like the Free Church, are situated in various contexts, some in capital cities, some in well, rather rural er areas. And we are culturally diverse as well, with Scots, Northern Irish, Canadian, Sudanese, and a Hong Kong man with a strange accent, as well as many Australians uh, among our ministers. And some of our congregations are very diverse. We have one mostly a Sudanese congregation and a, a Tongan congregation in our Sydney South uh, Church and many cultures being part of the PCEA. And we in Australia are facing the same rampant secularism as here in Scotland. And I'm sure some of you would know that last year Australia has legalised same-sex marriage and religious freedoms are being threatened. And what a reminder it is to us all that uh, it doesn't matter where we are, even though we are on different continents, the challenges to the furtherance of the gospel are similar. And what encourages us and what binds us together is indeed the same call to preach the gospel of grace from the same Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is for this reason I have come to you as the convener of uh, interchurch relations and to seek that mutual encouragement and support in the Lord. From, last, from your last year's uh, ecumenical relations report, the relationship between our two denominations was described as having long and valued historic links. And indeed, it is true that the PCEA on paper has the closest relationship to the Free Church. But in reality, we in Australia feel that especially in the recent times, this historic link may seem to have been neglected. And so, fathers and brethren, I've come with my request, not, to, not only to continue, but to deepen and further our interchurch historic bond. It is my hope and desire that there could be working relationships formed and developed. We have so much in common not only can we end to call, as mentioned before, both our ministers and probationers, the PCA is the only sister church that shares the same formula and ordination questions, sharing the same testimony, the same commitment to the full subscription to the Westminster Confession of Faith. And in terms of missions, we share the same concerns for our brothers and sisters in Peru, in South Africa, and indeed in India. And in fact, the PCEA recently has set up a student sponsorship scheme for the school in India. And this is one of the examples of how we can work together. And in terms of praise, a large number of our congregations using Psalms. And it is a blessing to see the development of a phone app by the Free Church, and it has been very timely indeed, and especially in our denomination, there has been this renewed interest and desire to sing from the Word of God from our young people. And I'm sure many of our uh, presenters will look forward to the PDF files of the tunes. And not only that, as you may be uh, aware that the PCEA doesn't have a theological college of our own, 
And therefore, in terms of training our students, we find in particular one of the char challenges is to provide adequate education on especially church principles. And it is my hope as a member also on the Training of Ministry Committee to seek help and resources from uh, now the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Theological Seminary through online access perhaps. And these are simply some of the examples in which we can work together in the gospel. And while we rejoice greatly with you in furthering the ecumenical relations down under, especially with the Presbyterian Church of Australia, this is my plea. Please do not forget us, colloquially known as the Free Church in Australia. And indeed, as a denomination in the recent times, we have experienced a number of vacancies I mentioned before in our charges, and I would remind you, fathers and brethren, Australia is open, and the Presbyterian Church of Eastern Australia also needs faithful ministers to further the cause and kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is my hope and prayer that our mutual eligibility relationship would be continued and furthered and strengthened at various levels, encouraging one another, building one another up in the most holy faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we seek to bring that true light of the gospel, not only to Scotland, but also to Australia. Last but not least, it is our prayer for the Free Church, as the Apostle Paul wrote, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, thank you, and may the Lord bless and guide you throughout your general assembly. Thank you. Mother, well, here some uh, months ago, the Reverend Dr. John P. Wilson of the Presbyterian Church of Australia uh, brought a group of people from that denomination over to Scotland. It was our pleasure to entertain them over in the offices. Uh, I remember we gave them tea and scones were baked especially for them. Uh, the scones were so good that Mr. Dr. Wilson has returned for some more scones. So this is his second visit in uh, the last few months to the United Kingdom, to Scotland. Moderator, I would introduce Dr. Wilson to you. Dr. Wilson, you are very welcome indeed. We are so grateful to have a growing relationship with your church you. and to hear of the good things that God is doing. Thank you. And we do pray for that part of the world. We pray that God will be glorified and exalted among you. And do please address the General Assembly. Uh, moderator, thank you very much for the invitation and the warm welcome, and I've returned uh, not for scones, but for the haggis that I had at lunch. It was sweet, sweet as. Moderator, as I've been there for the last several hours, listening and observing, uh, what a joy it is to be in a church assembly that is... I could close my eyes, and except for one thing, I could close my eyes and think I'm home. This is our assembly. These are the issues. These are the gospel issues that we prayerfully and vigorously sometimes debate and, and, and consider together. The, 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 the issues that I've been listening to and, and the issues of um, uh, extending the kingdom, the issues of, of preaching grace, the, the, the issues of uh, all of those things have, have just been, except for one thing, moderator, can I just admit this, get it off my chest. That foot stamping, it just threw me. I've never experienced foot stamping. I thought they're all angry. What? That. <laughs> so that's... No, well, I, I thought you were angry. <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite relieved. Um, so thank you for the welcome. Thank you for the gospel issues that you're working through prayerfully and in a godly fashion and with great grace and wisdom. And I'm encouraged by that. 
And, and these are the very same issues that in Australia, the Presbyterian Church of Australia, PCA, are working through. Thank you also for the courtesy that you give delegates. It's been a joy to sit with Robin uh, and to sit and to recognise a fellow Australian Presbyterian, our, our sister church. It's been great to uh, listen to um, our friend from Singapore. It's been wonderful to be greeted by Sam and Susan Logan. Uh, you know, this is a little off the topic, but, but he gave to me uh, my first book on preaching. So this was 40 years ago, or nearly yeah, over 40 years ago, when I first was thinking about training for ministry, what is preaching? And before someone else gave me later on uh, Spurgeon's lectures to my students, which is just fabulous, and then someone thrust Martin Lloyd-Jones, but that's about all we had 45 years ago. I mean, we've got bookshelves and libraries on preaching, but we only had three or four. And Sam Logan produced his symposium on preaching. And, and I learnt for the very first time a brand new word, um, phenomenology. I had to go look up the dictionary. But when I worked out what he was talking about, the phenomenology of preaching, uh, it really gripped me, the, the experiential side of preaching, that we're actually delivering, the, um, we're declaring the message of God and we're actually expecting people to change. We're actually expecting an encounter. I hope, Professor, that's what you were saying, because I, I, that's what I got from your, from your book and your essay. And, and I go back to that several times through my preaching career, I go back to Sam Logan's Phenomenology of Preaching and all the other articles in his wonderful symposium. It's been great to meet you. It's been great to sit with John Nichols, who was your moderator when uh, I was asked to be moderator of the Presbyterian Church of, of, of Australia. You sent John Nichols to our assembly and he, he endeared himself to our... We, we love John. And uh, send him again. He's a wonderful ambassador for the Free Church of Scotland. And uh, <laughs> are you cross? No, no, right. And, and, and our friend Willie Mackay, who was a valued member of our um, mission cause by being principal of the Presbyterian Ladies College for several years, many years ago. And it's just been great how you look after visitors and, and you give them this chance. Um, let me just give you very briefly a, a, a word of encouragement, but it's also, it also could be a word of warning. Uh, that where you are now isn't necessarily where you will be. And very easily you can, as a denomination, as a church, you can lose the evangelistic zeal and understanding of grace and the preaching of the word. Things can change. Mm. Just be careful. But let me give you the encouragement about things can change because in the 1950s, the Presbyterian Church of Australia was on the nose. It was bad. PCA, I mean, anybody with a reform conviction wouldn't dare join the PCA. Mm. And in fact, let me give you proof. There were several Christian families that migrated to Australia from the Netherlands. Now they brought their reformed faith, their commitment to reformation teachings, they sniffed the air, they looked around Australia, and they said, not for us. And they wrote a declaration to actually tell us what they thought of us. 1951, uh, the Dutch give it straight. Uh, we regretfully confess, they declared, that for conscience sake, we're not in a position to join the Australian churches. We have this against you, right? Uh, one, that, that in your pulpits, uh, there is modernist preachers. True. Secondly, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is not properly serviced, uh, not, not at all fenced. Uh, thirdly, that the discipline and the teaching of life and the discipline of the life of members and the life of leaders is not exercised. True, true, true. And let me put it on the record. If I was entering the church in 1951, I wouldn't have joined my church either. But by the wonderful, amazing grace of God, we are not what we were. Sounds a little bit like Paul writing in the Corinthians chapter 6 in a different context. What you were, but what you are now. You are now washed. You are now clean, he, Paul says. You are not what you were. And the Lord granted us in 1977 a blessed departure. And, and more than two-thirds of our number voted to go into the Uniting Church and just a third or a little less than a third decided it will stay Presbyterian. That was a blessed gift, that departure. And, and, and since 1977, the Lord has reformed us 
in nature and reformed us in practice and is still reforming us. One of the speakers, or was it you, moderator, yeah. that, that took, my, took my example right out of my mouth. Yeah. He's already, you've already told us about the, the, the unheard of ability of a church under the reforming grace of God, the unheard of example of being able to, in a, in still in a big denomination, 600 churches, you know, 600 ministers, to be able to reverse the decision for the ordination of women. Uh, I think the world's replete with examples of going the other way. I don't know of any other example of a mainline church mm. of reversing that decision. That's part of the gracious work that God has done on us. Mm. And, and the, the Lord has returned us to the Bible, returned us to the Reformed confessions that we before ticked in a nominal way, but now we well, we don't sign it with our blood like the Covenanters, but it, we, we sort of sign it with our heart. Uh, we, we love the Westminster Confession of Faith and we endeavour to have that as our doctrinal statement. And, and we have now, every pulpit in the land under PCA has now been rid of, call it what you want, outright liberalism or a Scottish form of moderatism or, or anything else. It's, it's completely gone. And uh, now we are involved in, in uh, church planting and revitalising weaker churches and, and spreading the gospel across the world and, and serving Christ with overseas missionaries like never before and uh, establishing work with partner churches such as where I'm going to on the weekend, which is Zambia. Mm -hmm. and, and your guest this morning, was it? Um, yes. Reverend John Gondwa. Uh, he and I worked together in Zambia some years ago. So it was absolutely a delight to sit next to him this morning. Uh, that's where I'm headed, just to serve our, our, our partner church, uh, CCAP, the Church of Central Africa Presbyterian, and we have a strong continuing year-by-year -year relationship with that church in Malawi and that church in Zambia as well. So, uh, moderator, Proverbs 25, 25 uh, says, uh, as cold water is to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. Mm. Now, you can't get farer <laughs> than Australia. Mm. Can you, David? Mm. And you can't get farer than the Southern Isle of Tasmania, of, of Australia, where he's, he was. It, it's at least 11,000 miles between Edinburgh and Melbourne where I serve. But in this country, uh, the Presbyterian Church of Australia is, yes, it's sort of mainline, but it's the only mainline church I know of that is committed to the Westminster Confession of Faith, preaching grace, evangelistic zeal, and uh, honouring God and, and, and pleasing God with our worship. So thank you for allowing us to be a, a visiting delegate. It's a great privilege. This is a great church. I, if, I was, if I was a Scot, I'd be here, I tell you. I wouldn't be across the road. Wouldn't be down there, I'd be here. Uh, this is my sort of church. And uh, just to uh, mark this occasion, I, I've got a gift for you, moderator. So representatively, this is a gift to all, but it's got to go to one person, so it's got to be you. I, I thought, well, what could I give? Here is a work by an Australian Presbyterian theologian who I work with. He's a dear friend of mine, and uh, I thought I'd bring him to you. Thank you. And, and when you're next working on a series of texts from the book of Exodus, I, I'd love you to um, pick this up and remember today. And uh, our friend uh, is Dr. Alan Harmon. No stranger to the no, free no church stranger. of Scotland. Uh, and uh, a second book, so that's for you and your sermon work. Thank you. Uh, another book by Professor Harmon, uh, our dear friend and colleague, is Preparation for Ministry. So when you next have an aspiring young man who says, I'm feeling the tug of God upon my heart, sit with him and work through this book on uh, preparing for ministry. Finally, I have another gift for you. And uh, this is my story. It's a personal story because 
In actual fact, I feel really at home in Edinburgh. I know I don't sound like it, but I feel really at home in Scotland. My wife, family came from Greenock, uh, the other side. M my family come from, I, I don't know where Southwest is, but, but let's say that's Southwest, maybe. Uh, a, a half hour drive down there is a, is a little unknown town called Wilson Town. And my forebears founded Wilson Town and they founded the iron ore industry that grew up. And, and my family employed a massive industry down there. It's just near, where's Klimpy? Just a little bit south of Klimpy and right next to Forth is, 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 my, is where my family comes from. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's my family story. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your visit and for your kindness. Uh, perhaps to show your appreciation for Mr. Wilson, for Dr. Wilson, if I say to you, God is good. All the time. All the time, God is good. That's something we've both learned from Malawi. Moderator. Um, our next guest is again a good friend of the denomination from a church that's a good friend, the Reverend Young Bok Kim from the Hapdong Presbyterian Church of Korea. Mr. Kim. It's a great joy to welcome you, Mr. Kim. We're so glad to have you in Scotland and at the General Assembly. And the principal clerk tells me you are a great romantic <laughs> and that you took your wife to, South ha to North Harris to Avingsuya Castle for your 25th wedding anniversary. Um, was it the fishing that took you there or was it your wife? But whichever it was, I'm glad you were there in the beautiful island of Harris. Please address the General Assembly. <clears throat> yeah, it's a hard time, so I make it short. And write it down. <laughs> um, we greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We want to uh, thank all of you, especially moderator Reverend Meng Lee, uh, who welcomed us with a warm heart and gives us a, a lovely lunch for today for us when we are uh, strangers in this city. And thank you all the pastors and elders to give an opportunity to speak here in this General Assembly. Uh, first of all, let me introduce our members. We are from Gyeonggi Presbytery, General Assembly of Presbyterian church in Korea. Uh, we are uh, present moderator uh, Seyong Park and present uh, club Reverend Kison Kim and former moderator is me and uh, former clerk uh, Reverend Chung. Yeah, we are from, yeah. Uh, we have shared the uh, brotherhood between Western Isle Presbytery in Lewis and Gyeonggi Presbytery in Seoul, Korea uh, since 2005 up to now. Uh, and we made an exchange visit each other every other year. Uh, furthermore, Whenever we're having a presbytery meeting, which is uh, twice in a year, every second week of the April and the October, um, we have intercessory prayer uh, for the Western Isle Presbytery and its churches and pastors. During last April uh, presbytery, uh, I was praying for Western Isle. I would like to request you to pray for Korean Christianity. Um, it is threatened by the enormous ch uh, challenge of uh, religious pluralism and the rapid 
uh, increase in the number of migrant workers, which is resulting in the expansion of the Islamic religion. Due to the uh, secularization of Christianity, the Korean church is uh, losing its social authority to others. Please pray again for the congregation in Korea that they will be able to return to the heart of gospel and embrace the power from our Father in heaven. In addition, the North and South Korea, the sole divided countries in the world, uh, have just begun their dialogue to enter into the age of peace. Thus, it would be grateful to you for praying that they could reach the mutual uh, agreement on the peaceful reunification. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank May the you. Lord bless you and keep you. God bless. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we are just doing a small uh, present for you and Clark. And then uh, uh, Luis, uh, moderator, That's and Clark also. Very, very is, kind. Is, is possible. That's right now we very, can. very gracious of you. And I, it's not often that uh, moderators and clerks receive gifts, but uh, today I received coffee and books. <laughs> And this is a, a very good, I think this should go into standing orders, really. <laughs> a very good arrangement, so that yeah. your kindness and generosity. It's a small thing. Yeah, well, I'm most grateful to you for your kindness. It's for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. But, uh, you said... The retiring moderator <laughs> can, can come and discuss his issue. No, no. Thank you very much. It's a small thing. Uh, it's a jars from uh, jars of clay. Jars of clay. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you remember the Second Corinthians Second chapter four, verse four. seven. Yeah. <laughs> it's a small thing, but yeah, it's a memorandum. Is it Clark. Yeah. 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 Clark is here. Yeah. 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 This is very kind of you. What's the name? Nobody. Please, uh, do we I have the know. moderator of the Presbytery of the Western Isles here? We do. Yes. We do. Ah, yes. Mr. Davis, <laughs> you didn't know this was happening, did you? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. This will you. have to go on your P11D. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your prayers. Yeah. I have uh, visited two times. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. We are so grateful to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. Kind. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. I, Thank you. I think I need to pose for a photograph with you here. Yeah. Thank you. you wish to take a photograph. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got not very tired because of time difference. You know, yes. So it's Thank you. Us. One more. Thank you very Thank much. You. The Lord's Thank bless you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope Mr. Logan doesn't feel under any obligation whatsoever. <laughs> Moderator, uh, our next guest is not so much a guest as a force of nature. So it is our delight to welcome uh, the Reverend Dr. Sam Logan. Uh, Sam represents today the World Reformed Fellowship. Um, he is also an ordained minister of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. He is a long-standing friend of the Free Church of Scotland. His greatest position, however, is the one he holds currently as interim minister for one month of Trotternish Free Church of Scotland in Sky. So where's my book to you? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Please address the assembly. Mr. Moderator, for fathers and brothers, I'm very much aware of the fact that as soon as I quit talking, you get to go to dinner. Therefore, I will be quick. I felt that the uh, time at um, Stefan and uh, Uig went fairly well this past Lord's Day, at least until I heard one comment as a result of my uh, preaching. Uh, one person commented, he sounds just like Donald Trump. 
I, I, I do hope that that was related to my accent and not to the content of my, of my sermon. The, uh, the World Reform Fellowship founds, finds its roots in chapter 25 of the Westminster Confession of Faith particularly paragraphs two and three. Now you've all got that memorized. Um, the first paragraph of chapter 25, which discusses the church, the first paragraph deals with the universal invisible church. And then the Westminster Divines decided to spend twice as much time, paragraphs two and three, on the universal visible church. We seek in the World Reform Fellowship to give expression to those two paragraphs of the Westminster Confession of Faith. We have um, denominational, congregational, organizational, and individual members. All of them, all of them must subscribe in writing to one of the great reformed confessions, Westminster, Dort, Heidelberg, and in addition, to the statement that the Bible is without error in everything it teaches. During the, um, during the past year, we required all of our members to renew their memberships, to be sure that their theological commitments remain consistent with our founding principles. Views can change, and we just wanted to be sure that the membership of the WRF is still committed to those principles. The renewed memberships include 63 denominations. The Free Church, you are a denominational member, the Free Church and 62 other denominations from places like Australia, Egypt, Hungary, Madagascar, Pakistan, South Korea, Hapdong, Brazil and Mexico. Brazil and Mexico now form two of the three largest Presbyterian denominations in all of the Americas. We also have 51 congregational members, including places like Nepal, Japan, and Turkey. 105 organizational members, seminaries, Bible colleges, mission boards, and 325 individual members. We're a, a networking organization primarily. We exist to connect like-minded, evangelical, reformed Christians so that, this is our little tagline, so that the strengths of some might become the strengths of all in the service of Jesus Christ. What specifically might that look like? Well, I have some sheets over on the table there, and I have, give me that pen back quickly, yeah. I have some pens here for you. Um, this is not intended as a little light of mine kind of pen, but it does function that way when it, when it works. Uh, pick those up if you'd like on the end. What other examples might I give of what we do to give expression to the Westminster Confession, chapter 25? You know the music of Keith and Kristen Getty. Uh, their organization, Getty Music, is an organizational member of the World Reformed Fellowship, and uh, on Monday night, we sang one of their songs, Jesus, Draw Me Ever Nearer. Um, they wrote me two weeks ago, saying that they are eager further to globalize their mu music ministry, and asking if we would help them again. They've made this kind of request before. It's this time, they would like us to help them by identifying 10 key influential leaders from around the world whom they would then bring to their conference in Nashville, Tennessee in September, all expenses paid to help them understand what globalizing gospel music might look like. At, and we provided the names of individuals from the following countries, Australia, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, and Scotland. And Scotland was the only one to get two nominees a fellow named David Robertson, have you heard that? And um, another fellow, Angus McRae. <clears throat> so they will be getting uh, all expense paid trips to Nashville in September if they want. I got a, an email from them last night confirming everything, they'll be in touch. Um, I must insist on twin rooms. Twin rooms. Twin rooms. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's remarkable because David Robertson made the same request. <laughs> uh, 
several years ago, a small group, about eight evangelicals in Sierra Leone, started meeting together for Bible reading, Bible memory, prayer. And um, they found our website, the WF website. They um, started using the materials there. Their group has now grown to 400 individuals. And they want to start an evangelical reformed church in Sierra Leone, but they don't know how. So they wrote us and asked, could we be of any assistance to them? We referred them to one of our organizational members, uh, Timothy Tu, uh, a church planting and church revitalization organization. They are a member of the WRF. And make a long story short, we, the WRF, have paid all the expenses to send the CEO of Timothy II to Sierra Leone at this very time, here at the end of May, to guide those brothers and sisters toward the pro through the process of becoming a specific local church. We don't do church planting. The WRF doesn't do church planting. We connect people who want church planting with those who have those skills. In April, another example, in April, I had the privilege of making a WRF presentation at a church in Western Pennsylvania. One of the members of that church uh, was born in Russia and has married an American, but remains very eager now to provide evangelical reformed theological materials to friends and family back in Russia. We were asked by that individual for help in finding those materials. We uh, wrote all of our members about this request, and within a week, we had 27 offers of reformed literature in Russian. And of course, that included books of people like uh, Brother Sinclair Ferguson, whom I hired three different times when I was in the seminary business. Uh, we do hold meetings uh, to which we invite our members. In 2010, we held a meeting here at the University of Edinburgh I remember that um, one, one topic that we discussed was how our member churches might respond to the challenge of same-sex marriage concerns. I had three panelists on that, uh, on that day. David Court, who was uh, the senior pastor of what was then New Wrestlerig Church uh, here in Edinburgh. Ron Skates was the pastor of one of the largest PCUSA congregations in the USA and Henry Arombi. He was the Anglican Archbishop of Uganda. I remember uh, David and Ron talked at some length about all of the difficulties of trying to protect their commitments in the church from this same-sex challenge. And uh, then when Henry came to the uh, microphone, he said, I don't see the problem. I just tell our 10 million members what to believe and they believe it. <clears throat> Maybe there's something to be said for the Anglican ecclesiology. Uh, in uh, October of last year, a uh, rather important year, we hosted a major conference on the Reformation in Wittenberg. And uh, among the excellent speakers, Ivor Martin, David Robertson, and all of the videos, including David's and Ivor's, are available online on our website. We um, sponsor an annual event called Women in the Word, a, uh, a ministry that's, that's based on our commitment about where, where ordination is proper, but is convinced that we need to utilize the incredible gifts of our women in our midst. And so this is an intensive workshop specifically designed to teach women to study and to teach the Bible to other women. This year's program in, in October will be our 13th, and the subject this year is the good news about God's judgment. Within a week after, uh, speaking again about our uh, website, within a week after President Trump had announced the decision to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, we had on our website responses to that decision by an Israeli member of the World Reform Fellowship and by a Palestinian member of the World Reform Fellowship. We will be in uh, Jerusalem in two weeks for the meeting of GAFCON, and we'll see both of those, the Israeli and the Palestinian, both absolutely committed evangelical reformed Christians with rather substantial differences of opinion 
about the move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Lots of other material on the website, uh, article by a PCA minister, that's Presbyterian Church in America, John, uh, Presbyterian Church in America minister working in Prague. His article argues about how and why we should seek more cooperation with Roman Catholics. And a response to that by another WRF member living in Rome who says we need to be extremely cautious about any such cooperation. We try to bring those diverse opinions, all from evangelical, inerrantist points of view, to, um, to our, our members. Several um, excellent articles also by a man named Fergus MacDonald. You may have heard of him. He is uh, one of the members of our board of directors. Thank you very much for your welcome here. Now you may go to dinner. Thank you. Well, brothers, we have really, really enjoyed all of your contributions this afternoon. And it, uh, it reminds us that we are a family, we are a global church. I was minded to think of uh, something Francis Schaeffer wrote about in hearing from several of you about the challenges that you face in different contexts and in different parts of the world. Schaeffer said, and he, he was prophetic, uh, it, it, he wrote so long ago, but so much of what he spoke about has taken place and is taking place. And one thing that he said stays with me. Tell me what the world is saying today, and I will tell you what the church is saying in seven years. And we have seen that in different cultures, in different parts of the world. We need to stay building the, the edifice, the household of God, on the foundation. And it is wonderful to have brothers representing churches from various parts of the global church who are building on that sure foundation. And if we do so, we are assured that whatever storms may come, that foundation in Christ and in his word will not disappoint us. Please bring our love, our esteem, and our thanks to your various churches and assure them of the prayers of the Free Church of Scotland and the interest of the Free Church in what God is doing in all your various responsibilities. The Lord Jesus told visitors to bring a report to John the Baptist when he was locked up in prison. And one of the things that they were told to do was to tell that the poor are hearing the gospel being preached to them. We are glad that through your work, the poor hear the gospel. And I hope you will go and say that in Scotland, the Free Church still desires that the poor, the spiritually poor, and all the poor will continue to hear the gospel. May God build us together until we grow to be one man in Christ Jesus and see his coming glory and his coming kingdom. God bless you and thank you for your fellowship in the Lord. Brethren, we've gone over time. It's my fault, so you can be very angry with me later on. But I think we really must suspend. Do we have any announcements? Well, dear, there are one or two announcements. First of all, the receiving party for the visit of the Lord High Commissioner will meet at the clerk's table immediately on adjournment. And on that score, the moderator and the, and the clerks have considered expanding uh, the receiving party to include others outside of uh, the membership of the assembly to reflect other workers in the church. Uh, and we are pr proposing that uh, we should do that for this year. And if you are in agreement, that we would add the mission coordinator, coordinator to the receiving party for this year. Thank you. Okay. And this is. Uh, First call for amendments for the Board of Ministry. The last call will be this evening. I do have one amendment uh, so far, so please, the last call for that will be this evening. Uh, and now the General Assembly adjourned to meet in this hall at 6.30 p.m., of which public intimation is now made. Let us pray. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners 
And now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen.